morning, everyone. I'm going to count down from five in order to turn on the live stream. After the countdown, we can start. Five, four, three, two, one. The House the Committee on the Judiciary will come to order. Without objection, the chair is authorized to declare recesses of the committee at any time. We welcome everyone to this morning's hearing on what's next, the threat to individual freedoms in a post-Roe world. Before we begin, I'd like to remind members that we have established an email address and distribution list dedicated to circulating exhibits, motions, or other written materials that members might want to offer as part of today's hearing. If you'd like to submit materials, please send them to the email address that has been previously distributed to your offices, and we will circulate the material to members and staff as quickly as we can. And before we start, I'd like to uh, warn the members that because we have votes at 12.30, I'm going to have a very tight gavel. Five minutes will mean five minutes on the dot. I will now recognize myself for an opening statement. What is the meaning of freedom in America in 2022? This is the question that we as a society must confront today in the wake of the Supreme Court's appalling decision in Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization, which eviscerated the constitutional right to abortion and laid the groundwork for a radical reshaping of our fundamental liberties. As we reckon with the consequences of this decision for women's health and individual liberty, we must also consider which other constitutional protections, such as the right to contraception, the right to marry whomever we choose, and the fundamental right to privacy may also fall by the wayside if the current Supreme Court majority continues down its dangerous path. By overturning 50 years of precedent in Roe v. Wade and Planned Parenthood v. Casey, the court denied the right of women to equality, bodily autonomy, and essential health care, rights that they have justly relied on to order their lives for almost a half century. In doing so, the court removed from individuals the power to decide the fundamental question of whether to carry or terminate a pregnancy, and instead gave that power to the government, making decisions about when and how to start a family is central to women's lives. It is the very essence of what it means to be secure in one's bodily autonomy and basic human dignity, which are prerequisites for freedom. In Dobbs, the court's majority ignored these fundamental principles and instead turned back the clock 50 years. And make no mistake, Overturning Roe is just a start. Republicans and anti-abortion forces are determined to enact a nationwide ban on abortion the next time they control the political branches of the federal government. You don't have to take my word for it. Senate, Major Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell made it clear that, quote, it's possible, close quote, that a Republican-controlled Congress would enact such a ban. The Washington Post reported that, quote, leading anti-abortion groups and their allies in Congress have been meeting behind the scenes to plan a national strategy, including a push for a strict nationwide ban if Republicans retake power in Washington. But the impact of Dobbs may be even broader than undermining abortion access. For much of the last two generations, Congress, the Supreme Court, and the executive branch have acted, even if with some considerable backsliding at times, to protect and in some cases to expand guarantees of personal liberty and autonomy against government interference. These constitutional and legal guarantees of personal liberty, in turn, reflect in American society's move toward an ever more expansive view of individual freedom. Today, however, a radical right-wing majority on the Supreme Court seeks to challenge the broad arc of our nation's history, an arc that, has been, that had been bending towards greater freedom and justice for all. This majority, made up of conservative judicial activists, has barely tried to hide its aim of eviscerating many of the protections for personal liberty that we as a society had come to believe would remain in place. Indeed, on the right to abortion, a decisive majority of Americans believe that the court was wrong to overturn, Rose, to overturn Roe's constitutional guarantee for abortion access. But the court has defied the will of the American majority, and in doing so has undermined its own legitimacy in their eyes. While Justice Alito specifically claimed that Dobbs was limited to abortion had no effect on other fundamental rights, I find that assurance cold comfort. The court's reasoning in Dobbs, if taken to its logical extent, <laughs> could serve as a roadmap for this conservative majority to eviscerate in future cases other fundamental rights premised on the right to privacy and the doctrine of substantive due process more generally. According to this Supreme Court's major majority's limited conception of ordered liberty, 
Our understanding of the fundamental freedoms guaranteed by the Constitution should be frozen in amber at the time the Constitution and the 14th Amendment were ratified. Periods in history when, when women and minorities were largely locked out of public life and American democracy. Moreover, Justice Thomas's concurrence is the proverbial canary in the coal mine. There, Justice Thomas said out loud what the rest of the court's majority sought to keep quiet, that under the reasoning of the Dobbs decision, other fundamental rights should be vulnerable to future attack. By calling on the court to reconsider and overturn all of its substantive due process jurisprudence, including specifically precedents recognizing constitutional protections for, con for contraception, intimate relations, and marriage equality, Justice Thomas practically invited legal challenges to these and other rights. That said, these other fundamental rights premised on the right to privacy, the doctrinal foundation for Roe and Casey, remain the law of the land. This includes the landmark decisions that Justice Thomas explicitly targeted. But what the example of the Dobbs decision teaches us is that we cannot be complacent or allow ourselves to be left scrambling to respond after worst case scenarios have come to fruition if we want to secure fundamental rights for all Americans. This is true especially in the face of a determined onslaught by the conservative legal movement and its allies on the court. To secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, as our Constitution's preamble states, we must remain vigilant against forces hostile to that liberty, including, unfortunately, the current majority on the Supreme Court. We should also consider legislative measures that will secure rights that the Constitution currently guarantees, no matter what may happen in the future. I thank our witnesses for their participation in today's hearing, and I look forward to their testimony. I now recognize the ranking member of the Judiciary Committee, the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Jordan, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Here's what the court said. To ensure that our decision is not misunderstood or mischaracterized, we emphasize we emphasize that our decision concerns the constitutional right to abortion and no other right. Nothing in this opinion should be understood to cast doubt on precedents that do not, do not concern abortion. The court also said this, and this is critical. We hold that Roe and Casey must be overruled. The Constitution makes no reference to abortion and no such right is implicitly protected by any constitutional provision. It is time to heed the Constitution and return the issue to the people's elected representatives. Those statements are what bother the left. That's what, the, their beef is with the Constitution. The court was real clear. The Constitution means what it says. But the left and the Democrat Party are so pro-abortion that tomorrow they're gonna pass legislation here in the House of Representatives that will allow the taking of an unborn child's life right up until their birthday. And they are so pro-abortion that they are willing to engage in all kinds of efforts to intimidate the highest court in our land. Started, started a while back when the Senate Majority Leader said this on the steps of the United States Supreme Court. I want to tell you, Gorsuch, I want to tell you, Kavanaugh, you've released the whirlwind and you will pay the price. You won't know what hit you if you go forward with these decisions. The intimidation of the court continued when the chairman of this committee 15 months ago introduced legislation to add not one, not two, not three, but four associate justices to the United States Supreme Court. The intimidation continued when this committee and the left in a concerted effort targeted Justice Thomas and his wife went after them, repeated, we had a hearing on it here in this committee. And then of course, the intimidation reached a, something we've never seen, something that's never happened before. Leak of a draft opinion by the court. Never happened in the history of the country. So focused they, are they on, on going against the Constitution and having their pro-abortion agenda happen. And of course, after the leak, after their leak, there were protests at Justice's home in direct violation of a statute, 18 U.S.C. Section 1507. And of course, during, the, after the leak, while the case is pending in front of the court, this committee, in a further effort to intimidate the court, held a hearing on the subject matter pending before our highest court. And during that time, right after the leak, when all this protesting was going on at Justice's homes, 
when Justice Barrett had her children's school put online, when, when, when the, 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 the left put online where her family attends church on Sunday morning, the United States Senate passed legislation to give protection to Justice's families, and the Speaker of the House of Representatives held up that, they passed it unanimously, and the Speaker of the House held up that legislation for four weeks, for four weeks. And guess what happened during that time? Guess what happened during that four weeks? We had something else that's never happened in the history of this country. We had an assassination attempt on a sitting justice of the United States Supreme Court. Stop and think about it for a second. We have a Justice Department that has failed to prosecute anyone with a statute that's directly on point when people are protesting at Justice's home trying to intimidate, influence a decision pending before the court, a Justice Department that refuses to do anything, a Justice Department that is now complicit in this attack by the left to intimidate the court, complicit in going after a separate and equal branch of our government. I want to read something to you. It might take a while, but I want to read this. I think this is important because this, these are uh, attacks that have happened on crisis pregnancy centers and churches over the last 10 weeks. 10 weeks time. May 3rd, 2022, individuals uh, vandalized the CareNet Pregnancy Center in Frederick, Maryland. May 5th in Portland, Oregon, vandals smashed numerous windows, spray painted graffiti on the Southeast Portland Regional Resource Center. May 7th, activists vandalized a crisis pregnancy center in Denton, Texas. May 7th, Fort Collins, Colorado, activists painted on the doors of a Catholic parish. May 8th, Mother's Day, Individuals attempted to break into the Oregon Right to Life office in Kaiser, Oregon. May 8th, vandals spray-painted pro-abortion messages on the side of a pro-life pregnancy center in Manassas, Virginia. May 8th, a pro-life nonprofit center in Madison, Wisconsin, was set on fire and vandalized. And the words, if abortions aren't safe, then you aren't either, either were on the side of the building. May 13th, activists threatening, left threatening messages on the front of the Alpha Pregnancy Center in Reisertown, Maryland. May 18th, vandals targeted a women's faith-based medical clinic in Auburn, Alabama. May 25th, Linwood, Washington, pro-abortion activists smashed windows, vandalized the Next Step Pregnancy Center, left the threat on the, uh, on the outside of the building and graffiti. If abortion isn't safe, you aren't either. June 2nd, Anchorage, Alaska, staff member in community pregnancy center found nails placing, uh, placed facing upwards in cracks of the parking lot and graffiti all over the building. June 2nd, Jane's Revenge claimed credit for an attack in which its members broke windows and scrawled messages including God loves abortion, this is not safe, at the Agape Pregnancy Resource Center in Des Moines, Iowa. June 3rd, the Capitol Hill Crisis Pregnancy Center was the target of left-wing activists who threw red paint on the door, threw eggs at the window, spray painted the building with Jane Says Revenge. June 6th, Asheville, North Carolina, vandals broke windows, left graffiti on the Mountain Area Pregnancy Services Building. June 7th, the reports indicate that the group Jane, Jane's Revenge firebombed the Compassionate Care Pro-Life Pregnancy Center in Amherst, New York. June 10th, there was a fire at the Gresham Pregnancy Resource Center in Gresham, Oregon. June 10th, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, vandals smashed windows and put graffiti on the Hope Pregnancy Center. June 15th, Minneapolis, Minnesota, Activists smashed the windows of Minnesota citizens concerned for life's office. June 19th, Redford Township, Michigan. Windows smashed at the Pregnancy Counseling Center. June 22nd, Jackson, Michigan. Vandals graffiti that smashed the windows of the office of the Jackson Right to Life. June 24th, Pregnancy Resource Center of Salt Lake City was vandalized within hours of the release of the Dobbs decision. June 24th. North Carolina, the GOP headquarters was spray painted with Jane's revenge threat, quote, if abortion isn't safe, neither are you. June 24th, St. Anthony's Catholic Church in Renton, Seattle was vandalized with authorities saying the suspect spray painted messages saying, saying things that I can't say here in the committee. June 25th, Lynchburg, Virginia, uh, pro-abortion activists vandalized the Blue Ridge Pregnancy Center. June 25th, St. Patrick's Catholic Church, Philadelphia was defaced with abort the church, uh, uh, spray painted on the outside of the church. June 25th, Paso Robles, California, vandals broke the window, spray painted the walls of the Tree of Life Pregnancy Support Center. June 25th, rioters breached the Arizona Capitol, rioting against the Dobb decision overturning Roe. June 25th, Vermont State Capitol building was vandalized by protesters who painted if abortions aren't safe, neither are you. June 25th, Cortez, Colorado, Heart to Heart Pregnancy Center was defaced with pro-abortion graffiti. June 25th, Longmont, Colorado, Vandals put graffiti and set fire to the Life Choices Free Pregnancy Services. June 25th, Portland, Oregon. 
Rioters vandalized Mother and Child Education Center for the second time since the leaked Dobbs decision. June 25th, Portland, Oregon, All Saints Catholic Church had graffiti put on it. June 26th, Winter Haven, Florida, pro-abortion activists destroyed security cameras, spray-painted the Life Choice Pregnancy Center with all kinds of threatening messages. June 26th, Tallahassee, Florida, St. Philip's AME Church was targeted. June 27th, Upper West Side of New York, militant pro-choice network put graffiti, if abortions aren't safe, neither are you, on the Ascension Roman Catholic Church. June 27th, Portland, Oregon, protesters and rioters targeted Henson Baptist Church. Baptist Church. June 27th in Everett, Oregon, I'm at 37. We still got more. We got 50 of these. Everett Washington attempted arson attack on the Two Hearts Pregnancy Center. June 27th, Bellevue, Washington. Man caught on video smashing glass windows, spray painting messages all over St. Louis Catholic Church. June 27th, Lynchburg, Virginia. Pregnancy Center was vandalized with graffiti that included the phrase, if abortion ain't safe, you ain't safe. I guess proving that people who do this aren't just criminals, they've also failed English class. June 27th, a woman's friend pregnancy resource clinic in Yuba City, California had windows smashed. June 30th, in Nashville, Tennessee, Molotov cocktail thrown through the first floor window of Hope Clinic for Women, a pregnancy resource center. July 1st, St. Bernard Catholic Church, Madison, Wisconsin was vandalized. Messages put on the outside of the church that we can't read here. July 5th, Kenmore, Washington, CareNet of Puget Sound Center was vandalized and burned. Uh, St. Paul, Minnesota, July 5th, Crisis Pregnancy Center was vandalized. July 5th, Hialeah, Florida, the heartbeat of Miami Center was vandalized with hate messages. July 8th, Worcester, Massachusetts, Clearway Clinic, a pro-life pregnancy center. I got three more, Mr. Chairman. Pregnancy Center sustained smash windows and two doors and three windows. July, 20, uh, July 8th, Worcester, Massachusetts, Pro problem pregnancy, a crisis pregnancy center was across the street from Plamer, was hit with, with paint. And July 10th, Bethesda, Maryland, pro-abortion set fire to the North Beth Bethesda United Methodist Church, and Bethesda, Maryland, writers destroyed the headstones of Wildwood Baptist Church on July 10th. And finally, July 10th, Bethesda, Maryland, St. Jane Francis de Chantel Parish was broken into, set on fire, the pastor spoke about the attack saying, last night our church was vandalized, people broke in, they overturned statutes, statues, they tore down the stations of the cross, they desecrated the tabernacle, and they set the church on fire. The whirlwind that the majority leader talked about on the steps of the Supreme Court, the whirlwind he talked about that he called for, this is that whirlwind. And this is just in 10 weeks May 3rd through this past weekend. There are more that have happened since in the last few days. But just in 10 weeks, that all happened. We should be talking about that. And we should be asking the Justice Department in front of the Judiciary Committee, what are you doing about this sustained effort? It looks to me like domestic terrorist effort coordinated, it seems, in so many ways because the message was so often the same on so many of these crisis pregnancy centers. That, to me, seems what we should be focused on. But no, no, the Democrats want to talk about their radical pro-abortion agenda. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Let me just say that uh, no one condones arson or uh, threats, uh, but there's a long history from extremists on both sides. Planned Parenthood centers for many years have been the subject of attacks. Uh, abortion clinics have been the subject of attacks and even murder. The name of Dr. Barnett Slepian of, of uh, uh, Buffalo, New York, who was murdered uh, because he was an abortion provider comes to mind. So these long lists, both sides can have these long lists, and no one, condone, no one responsible condones any of it. Um, I will now introduce today's witnesses. Melissa Murray is the Frederick I. and Grace Stokes Professor of Law at New York University School of Law. Prior to joining the NYU faculty, she was on the faculty of the University of California Berkeley School of Law, where she also served as interim dean. Previously, she clerked for Sonia Sotomayor, then of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit, and Stephen Underhill of the U.S. Circuit Court for the District of Connecticut. Professor Murray received a B.A. from the University of Virginia and her J.D. from Yale Law School. Sarah Warbelow is the legal director for the Human Rights Campaign, where she has served in a variety of roles since 2008. Before joining HRC, Ms. Warbelow served as the program manager for the American Association of University Women Foundation Legal Advocacy Fund. 
She's also an affiliated professor at George Washington University and George Mason Law School. She received bachelor's degrees from Michigan State University and both a master's degree and a law degree from the University of Michigan. Catherine Glenn Foster is president and CEO of Americans United for Life. Previously, she spent seven years as litigation counsel with the Lions Defending Freedom. She then founded and managed a law practice and led Euthanasia Prevention Coalition USA as executive director. Ms. Foster earned her BA from Berry College, a master's degree from the University of South, Carol South Florida, and a JD from Georgetown University Law Center. Jim Obergefell was the named plaintiff in the landmark marriage equality case Obergefell versus Hodges, and is a public speaker and author on LGBTQ equality and civil rights issues. Previous careers include being a high school German teacher, corporate training, relationship manager, software education consultant, and real estate agent. He earned an undergraduate degree from the University of Cincinnati and attended graduate school at Bowling Green University. We welcome, in, we welcome our distinguished witnesses and we thank them for participating today. I will begin by swearing in our witnesses. I ask that our witnesses in person, uh, please ri rise and raise your right hand. I ask that our remote witnesses, please turn on your audio, and make sure I can see your face and your raised right hand while I administer the oath. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give is true and correct to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief, so help you God? Let the record show that the witnesses have answered in the affirmative. Thank you and please be seated. Please note, Please note that each of your written statements will be entered into the record in its entirety. Accordingly, I ask that you summarize your testimony in five minutes. To help you stay within that time, there's a timing light on your table. When the light switches from green to yellow, you have one minute to conclude your testimony. When the light turns red, it signals your five minutes have expired. For witnesses appearing virtually, there's a timer on your screen to help you keep track of time. Professor Murray, you may begin. Chairman Nadler, Ranking Member Jordan, thank you very much for this opportunity to appear before you in this hearing on the imminent threat to individual freedoms in a post-Roe world. My name is Melissa Murray. I am the Frederick I. and Grace Stokes Professor of Law at New York University School of Law, where I teach constitutional law, family law, and reproductive rights and justice, and serve as the faculty director of the Birnbaum Women's Leadership Network. Prior to my appointment at NYU, I was a faculty member at the University of California, Berkeley, where I served for 12 years and was the interim dean of the law school. The 14th Amendment guarantees all of us liberty and equality. And to understand the full extent of the amendment's protections, it is necessary to appreciate the concerns that animated its drafting and ratification. Proposed in the wake of the Civil War, the Reconstruction Amendments were consciously drafted and ratified for the express purpose of abolishing and repudiating slavery and its indicia. Accordingly, the 13th Amendment abolished slavery, the 15th Amendment enfranchised Black men and introduced them to the political community as equals, and the 14th Amendment was intended to repudiate the legal and cultural conditions that distinguish slavery from freedom, including the absence of bodily autonomy and control over procreation, the absence of family integrity and parental rights over children, and the inel ineligibility for civil marriage. Accordingly, the 14th Amendment did more than insist on the equality and citizenship of the formerly enslaved. Implicit in its understanding of liberty was the repudiation and eradication of these hallmark conditions of slavery. The right to abortion recognized in 1973's Roe versus Wade proceeds from this understanding of liberty and protects the decision whether to bear or beget a child. For nearly 50 years, the Supreme Court consistently affirmed the right to abortion as an essential aspect of the Constitution guarantees of liberty and equality. Yet, despite these longstanding precedents, on June 24th, the Supreme Court announced its decision in Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization, upholding Mississippi's 15-week ban on abortion and overruling Roe versus Wade and Planned Parenthood versus Casey. In the Dobbs decision, the court declared that the Constitution no longer protects the right to abortion, 
marking the first time the Supreme Court has withdrawn a fundamental right. But critically, the Constitution's protection of liberty and privacy is not confined to abortion, but also underlies the Supreme Court's recognition of various fundamental rights, including rights to contraception and procreation, marriage, family relations, child rearing, and sexual intimacy. Despite the majority's assurances that the Dobbs opinion implicates only the right to choose an abortion and does not cast doubt on these other precedents, its analytical framework clearly implicates these other liberty rights. According to the majority, Roe versus Wade was egregiously wrong because the Constitution does not explicitly identify a right to abortion, and such a right is not deeply rooted in the history or traditions of this nation. Although this account is inattentive to the history of the Reconstruction Amendments, the logic that the opinion applies could easily be translated to a range of other rights that the court has recognized, including the right to contraception, the right to same-sex marriage, and the right to sexual intimacy. Accordingly, the Dobbs decision invites reconsideration of Griswold versus Connecticut, which protects the right to contraception, Obergefell versus Hodges, which secures the right to same-sex marriage, Lawrence versus Texas, which protects the right to private consensual sexual relations, and many other decisions in the court's long line of substantive due process cases. And in a separate concurrence, Justice Thomas made clear his position on the scope of the Dobbs opinion. There, he calls for the court to reconsider all of the court's precedents, recognizing fundamental rights under the 14th Amendment's liberty guarantee. Although no other justice joined his concurrence, it would be a mistake to dismiss Justice Thomas's objections to these substantive due process rights as an irrelevant aside. Like many of his past opinions advocating for the destruction of fundamental liberty and privacy rights, Justice Thomas is signaling that the goalposts have moved and extremist litigators, judges, and lawmakers are sure to respond in kind. As the dissent in Dobbs states, the majority promises that the decision to overrule Roe does not undermine any associated right to marriage, procreation, contraception, and family relationships. But these promises cannot be trusted and communities affected by these decisions should not be satisfied with these baseless claims. And I, for one, am not satisfied with the majority's hollow assurances. And I call on this committee to protect these associated rights in a manner that is swift and absolute. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor. Uh, Ms. Warbelow, you are now recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Nadler, Ranking Member Jordan, and members of the committee for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Sarah Warbelow. I'm the Legal Director for the Human Rights Campaign, the nation's largest civil rights organization working to achieve lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer equality. It's an honor to testify here today on behalf of more than our three million members and supporters nationwide regarding the potential impact of the Dobbs decision on LGBTQ rights. I was born in a post-Row world to a mother who fought for her five daughters' reproductive rights and loved us all the more for being able to choose us. I am shaken to my core by the end of Row. Loss of abortion access is devastating, including to LGBTQ people who need access to safe and compassionate health care, including access to abortion, contraception, fertility services, so they can decide if they wish to become parents and when to do so. Dobbs is a radical rejection of 50 years of precedent, upending a settled body of case law upon which millions of Americans, including LGBTQ people, rely. The majority in Dobbs emphasized that it did not view the decision to overturn Roe as impacting the results in other substantive due process cases, even saying it's hard to see how we could be clearer. But its cursory analysis fails to meaningfully distinguish Dobbs from other substantive due process cases, except a point to fetal life. Frustratingly, the Dobbs opinion obliquely references Lawrence and Obergefell as examples the court regards as correctly decided to reject stare decisis and overturn prior precedent. But both Lawrence and Obergefell expanded the realm of individual rights and recognized that prior decisions reflected animus to and exclusion of LGBTQ people. By contrast, the court in Dobbs stripped away the rights of women and LGBTQ people to have control over when and whether to bear a child. Distinguishing Dobbs in this way provides cold comfort 
that the court might not be willing to reconsider the outcomes of Obergefell, Lawrence, and potentially even Loving if presented with the opportunity to do so down the line. In fact, Justice Thomas's extraordinary and alarming concurrence, disavowing substantive due process entirely, invites it. However, should the court choose to do so, these precedents have deep, double-stranded constitutional roots. And not only substantive due process, but also equal protection case law. Moreover, LGBTQ people have robust reliance interests that impact their relationship to the government and that carry financial, familial, and other obligations. To put it squarely, if Lawrence were overturned, a marriage certificate could be evidence of a crime. Today, nearly a dozen states retain laws criminalizing same-sex sexual relationships, and 35 states still have laws or constitutional amendments on the books that bar same-sex couples from marrying. Despite growing acceptance for LGBTQ people, coming out still comes at a cost. Anti-LGBTQ hate crimes and violence are at historically high levels. State legislatures have been particularly hostile to LGBTQ people since the Obergefell decision. Since 2015, 1,200 anti-LGBTQ bills have been filed in state legislatures. With Lawrence or Obergefell perceived at risk, state legislatures are likely to redouble their efforts to recriminalize intimacy between consenting adults and undermine marriage of same-sex couples. Justice Thomas's concurrence may inspire legislators to pass laws in conflict with existing precedent in the hopes that it will result in that precedent being overturned. State employees emboldened by Dobbs may engage in rogue discriminatory behavior for purposes of setting up a test case. Additionally, laws abrogated by Lawrence and Obergefell could be enforced anew. No single action can repair the constitutional crisis inflicted by Dobbs' radical rejection of precedent. But in addition to the Women's Health Protection Act, there are important steps Congress can take to stymie the damage. The Respect for Marriage Act, the John Lewis Voting Rights Enhancement Act, and the Equality Act would all provide important protections as we fight to restore the right to abortion and shore up other rights protected by substantive due process. This list is not exhaustive, but a starting point. There is no question that stemming the effects of Dobbs will require careful and concerted action at the federal and state levels. Moreover, there's no question that organizations like HRC will vigorously defend precedents that protect the right to marriage, to federal equality, and to loving who you love without fear of criminalization. Ultimately, as the Dobbs dissent stressed, the new majority of the Supreme Court may not be done with its work, but neither are we. Thank you, uh, Ms. Foster, you and I recognize for five minutes. I come before you honored to speak for all Americans who value human life. For every mom and dad, every family, every young person, every person who has fought to advance the human right to life. We survived Roe v. Wade, but Roe did not survive us. We are now living in a post-Roe America. So what comes next? The twilight of Roe, tragically, does not yet mean the dawn of a pro-life America, truly. The greatest threat to individual freedoms in a post-Roe world remains the reality that some would elevate their desire to kill over and against the natural right of each and every one of us to live. In a post-Roe world, all of us have incredible opportunities to proclaim that there is no liberty without life, without the freedom simply to be. Roe was extreme, but the pro-abortion lawmakers who called today's hearing and the pro-abortion witnesses want a future more extreme than even Roe made possible. Abortion money and abortion special interests continue to wield deadly power in Washington. Today's hearing is a testament to the menace of abortion's power brokers. Worse, abortion activists post-Roe are telling us that now, now, in this incredible moment, when lawmakers can finally uphold the human right to life, now that we might finally have the freedom to live, that it's now that all of our other freedoms are somehow at risk. It's hysteria, it's nonsense, it's just not true. Anyone who has read the Dobbs decision could tell you that. But there is good news. We can do better. It's in our nature as Americans to do better. 
Elizabeth Brunig, writing in The Atlantic just a few days ago, challenges us to make birth free for all Americans. And I agree with her. Pregnancy, childbirth, postpartum care, they should all be free for all mothers. And that's what today's hearing should be about, how to serve American mothers, fathers, and families. Let's have a hearing about that. Republicans boldly and courageously led the expansion of maternal and prenatal care during the Reagan era. There's truly no reason why making birth free for Americans can't be the bipartisan work of our time, the defining work of a Congress or of a presidency. Instead, even in this post-Roe world, some in Congress see fit to focus our attention on how to expand the killing power of the state. I know from my own experience of forced abortion, the traumatic consequences of abortion violence. I was hurt by abortion. My first child never lived to take her first breath because of abortion. It remains a scandal that any American state remains neutral on abortion, that any American state condones or celebrates abortion violence. I was failed by America's experiment with abortion during the Roe era. But out of that trauma, eventually, came clarity. My vocation, my life's work as a constitutional attorney and as a human rights advocate. As president and CEO of Americans United for Life, I've been so honored to travel the states and meet people of all ages, backgrounds, and beliefs. Americans who are united by their commitment to protecting our first and most intimate individual freedom to live. We know what pro-abortion activists want. Unrestricted abortion available always and everywhere. Every individual freedom we hear about today starts in their minds with the freedom to kill. But there is no such freedom. Abortion activism requires first dehumanizing our most vulnerable brothers and sisters and then hardening our hearts to the holistic challenges of living and thriving together. Contrary to what you may have heard, this life of ours is not a zero-sum game. No one needs to lose for others to win. We can only enjoy our authentic freedoms by living with a spirit of love, with solidarity, and with hospitality. The truth is, living and thriving together is hard, killing is easy. But as the most prosperous, most powerful, most free nation in history, it's our responsibility to do the right thing with the gifts we have, not because it's easy, but because it is hard. The common good of this American Republic depends on rediscovering what we, what we once knew, that America will be great if America is good. If not, her greatness will vanish away like a morning cloud. Let's be good to one another. Let's be better. Let's heal. Let's grow. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Obergefell, you are now recognized for five minutes. I'm endowed with the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I am part of we the people. All people in this nation, including LGBTQ plus people, are. My name is Jim Obergefell, and I'm the name plaintiff from Obergefell v. Hodges, the case that made marriage equality the law of the land. I felt joy as a lawfully wedded man. Nine years after my husband's death, I still find comfort as his widower. Everything changed when John and I said, I do. We felt different, we felt better, we felt more complete. But the state we called home, Ohio, ignored our lawful Maryland marriage. And make no mistake, Ohio harmed us. John was dying of ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. Even with our marriage license in hand, doctors, hospitals, and others could refuse to serve us. They could bar me from John's room, from making decisions on his behalf. John was nearing the end of his life and they had the right to ignore a dying man's most important relationship, to ignore any request or decision John and I made as husbands. Is that moral? Is that just? Is that right? We were not equal in life, even when most vulnerable, dealing with a terminal illness. After death, we would still not be equal. John's death certificate, his last official record as a person, would be wrong because Ohio would say he was unmarried and my name would not be listed as his surviving spouse. In the future, we would not be memorialized or interred together in John's family cemetery plot because the deed states that only direct descendants of his grandparents and their spouses were allowed. The cemetery and Ohio would not allow us to be together in death 
because they considered me a stranger. But I was no stranger. John and I had been a couple for more than 20 years. We shared everything with each other. We laughed, loved, and disagreed. We dreamed together, we struggled together, we built a world together. I became his full-time caregiver as John lost every ability due to ALS. Nothing was easy about that, but when you love someone, you care for them no matter what. If that was not marriage, I have no idea what is. We shared our vows and commitments in a lawful marriage ceremony. Yet to Ohio, our marriage did not exist. We were treated as less than full American citizens. We were considered separate. Yes, we could secure every legal document and solution available to us, but that is a burden unfairly placed on same-sex couples when opposite sex couples receive those rights, responsibilities, and protections by simply saying, I do. And it could never provide John the dignity of dying a married man with an accurate death certificate. And families are harmed when states ignore their marriages. Birth certificates would not have both parents' names. What happens to a child if the parent listed on the birth certificate dies? Will that child end up in the child welfare system instead of at home with the only other parent they have known? Will a parent be able to see their child in a hospital and make decisions for them, hold their child's hand through the pain, or worst of all, as their child takes their last breath? How is any of this pro-family or in the best interests of a child? No couple, no family should be forced to go to great financial expense and legal effort to gain a pale approximation of the rights and protections that come automatically with marriage. Yet those who are uncomfortable with our marriages and our families say that is the solution. But that is not marriage, and it sets our relationships and families apart as something less worthy. Discomfort or distaste is not a justifiable reason to deny another person their human and civil rights or to harm our families. If you do not protect our marriage equality, you are saying that we do not belong and we the people. You are telling us that we do not deserve life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, the happiness we find in love and family. It is shameful for any member of Congress to believe that. No relationship or person has been harmed because two men, two women, or two non-binary people got married. But those couples gained so much, rights, protections, dignity, and respect. We are one United States and states should not be allowed to deny or ignore our marriages. To argue that it, it is okay for our marriages, our families to vanish by crossing a state border, a border within our very own nation is appalling. It is harmful, it is un-American. Will you tell our nation's LGBTQ plus military members that their families no longer exist when they are deployed to a different state? Is that how you thank them for their service? How you show them respect? People's futures became brighter with Obergefell v. Hodges because they were no longer excluded from marriage and family. Parents felt joy and hope for their children. That day, many of us felt like an equal American for the first time in our lives. A young woman told me that if not for marriage equality, she would have killed herself. Let that sink in. How many other lives were saved that day? How many will be lost? What damage will be done to our families if our right to marriage is taken away? Our understanding of humanity and society should not be stuck more than 200 years in the past as of the writing of the Constitution, nor should our rights. That will not make the United States a more perfect union. What it will do is deny many of us our rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It will deny us our rightful place in we the people. Do the right thing and protect the right to marry. Protect and respect our families. Protect our rights to privacy and intimate relations. Thank you for this time. I thank all the witnesses for their testimony. We'll now proceed under the five-minute rule with questions. I want to note that we expect a very long series of votes this afternoon, and I will have to be very strict with the gavel to ensure that all members have an opportunity to ask questions before votes are called. With that, I will now recognize myself for five minutes. Professor Murray, does the Dobbs ruling open the door for an anti-abortion majority in a future Congress to pass a nationwide ban on abortion? It does, Representative Nadler. Thank you. Ms. Warbelow, in Dobbs, the dissent warns that a broader retraction of other rights is possible. Comparing the majority's decision to take away the constitutional right to abortion to pulling a stick out of a Jenga tower. Notably, Justice Thomas also wrote in a separate concurring opinion that the court should eliminate the doctrine of substantive due process, quote, at the earliest opportunity and called for the court to overturn Griswold v. Connecticut, Lawrence v. Texas, and Obergefell v. Hodges for some reason he left out loving. Can you discuss how the majority opinion in Dobbs could be used to challenge other cases involving individual freedoms? The 
court's profound rejection of uh, longstanding precedent over 50 years regarding substantive due process is terrifying. It suggests that the court does not have respect for the decisions that it has made, nor for advancing the rights of the people of the United States. Instead, it will callously strip away necessary and needed medical care for millions of people. What's important is that in the future, the court is situated in such a way that it is not willing to apply the Dobbs precedent to other cases. It should not do so. However, the court has not given us uh, found, profound belief that it will do so. Do you agree that Congress should fix its earlier mistake by repealing the Defense of Marriage Act? And would you su support some level of statutory protection for marriage equality? The Defense of Marriage Act is a stain on this nation. It represents a time in which there was incredible hostility to LGBTQ people. I have a deep fear that that hostility remains and is bubbling up once again. It was important for Congress to take critical steps to ensure that marriage equality remains the law of the land. I will note that the Respect for Marriage Act repealing uh, uh, DOMA was introduced by me many years ago. Thank Mr. You, Obergefell, thank you for your moving testimony. Because of your bravery, millions of people in the United States now have their marriage recognized as legally valid. Can you share with us more about what it was like for you and your husband before the Supreme Court recognized same-sex marriage as a constitutional right? Thank you, Representative Nadler. It was, it was harmful, it was hurtful to have committed lawfully to the person you love, that most important person in your world, to make those promises, those vows and commitments to each other in a lawful ceremony, and to have the state we call home ignore that, to say that we do not exist. And from the simple fact that as John was dying of ALS, as I mentioned in my remarks, that the fact that Ohio did not recognize our marriage gave every and any medical professional, paramedic, you name it, the ability to, to deny me access to John's room, to be with John, that could have prevented me from being with John as he took his last breath. And to know that we were just being ignored and the state of Ohio, as well as other states in this nation, would simply ignore our marriage and say, we don't care, you do not matter, you do not exist. That's incredibly harmful. And for the sheer fact that we were denied the ability to be memorialized or interred together in John's family cemetery plot, which is where he wanted to be. So the harm we faced was, was pervasive, it was terrible, and as Americans, we are supposed to be part of We the People, and that Defense of Marriage Act at the state level and throughout the nation, that clearly told us we did not belong, we were not part of We the People, and our existence, our marriages were not important. Thank you. Uh, Professor Murray, would you wish to uh, clarify anything that's been said for the record? I'm sorry, I didn't hear your question, Chairman Adler. Would you, you like to clarify anything that's been said for the record? I just want to emphasize that uh, the point that Representative Jordan made that this opinion was confined to the right of abortion is absolutely nonsensical. I mean, it is very clear from the logic of this opinion that despite the majority's assurances that this logic could be extended very easily to other rights. And Justice Thomas's concurrence makes that very clear. It is an open invitation to more litigation, and we are already seeing challenges to contraception throughout the states. Um, states that are proposing limiting access to long-acting contraceptions, and even certain individuals like pharmacists refusing to dispense certain forms of drugs because they may be, in addition to dealing right. with other health conditions, providing- Thank you, my, um, thank you. my time has expired, uh, Mr. Shabbat. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As hardworking families continue to struggle to make ends meet in the face of soaring inflation, now at a staggering 9.1%, the highest in 41 years, we're holding yet another hearing designed to divide the American people and distract them from the failed policies of the Biden administration. It's unfortunate that this is how the majority is choosing to use our limited time, but it does present an opportunity to dispel a number of misconceptions that have been disseminated by pro-abortion radicals and their allies in the media. The first and probably most widely spread misconception is that by overturning Roe, the Supreme Court outlawed abortion. This is simply not true. 
Instead, the Dobbs decision returns the power to regulate abortion to the states, where it always should have been and was prior to Roe. As a matter of public health, safety, and welfare, abortion regulation is properly delegated to the states by the 10th Amendment. What the question in Dobbs really boils down to is whether you think abortion is better addressed by the people's elected representatives and state legislatures or by nine unelected, unaccountable judges who serve on the court for life. The irony, of course, is that the pro-abortion forces who desperately want nine unelected judges to continue to control abortion decisions are upset by the very decision those nine unelected judges just rendered on abortion. Of course, they only want their preferred nine unelected, unaccountable judges to make these decisions. The second misconception is that Dobbs overturned some sort of sacred legal doctrine enshrined in the history of constitutional law. The truth is that the legal doctrine in question, substantive due process, has a much more checkered and murky past uh, and that abortion advocates would have you believe. In one of its earliest applications, substantive due process was used by Chief Justice Roger Taney, appointed by uh, Democrat Andrew Jackson, by the way, to the court, to uphold the right of slave owners to own slaves in the Dred Scott decision. That reprehensible decision led in many ways to the birth of the Republican Party, the election of Abraham Lincoln, the Emancipation Proclamation. A few decades later, the court used the doctrine to overturn state efforts to implement more stringent labor regulations, arguing that the proposed rules interfered with the fundamental right to contract. When the version of substantive due process threatened to derail the New Deal in the mid-1930s, FDR threatened to pack the Supreme Court, where we heard that before. Not surprisingly, while the court's liberal wing was opposed to substantive due process when it imperiled the New Deal, they were more than happy to utilize the theory when it met their needs, especially in Roe versus Wade. Ultimately, for over 150 years, substantive due process has been employed by liberal and conservative justices alike to find rights and liberties where other legal theories wouldn't adequately support the position that they wanted to adopt. In some ways, substantive due process helps justices fit square pegs into round holes. And that isn't likely to change. Any argument to the contrary is speculative fear-mongering. And that's an issue that ought to be addressed today, the dangerously inflammatory rhetoric that's being employed by pro-abortion radicals. The Democrats have been single-mindedly focused on the rhetoric that led up to tragic events of January 6th, and yet, for the most part, they've been silent when similar language and tactics are used by their supporters. We all know about the attempt on Justice Kavanaugh's life, as well as the harassment that he faced, he faced just a week ago. Less widely known are the threats that we've seen aimed at pregnancy care centers across the country, as Mr. Jordan referred to. Now, following the leak of the Supreme Court's draft decision in Dobbs, violent abortion groups have targeted uh, these facilities, and on Tuesday, Senator uh, Elizabeth Warren even demanded that crisis pregnancy centers be shut down all across the country. And over the years, I visited a number of those facilities. They do great work for women and their unborn children, and then when the children are born. Ms. Foster, let me ask you, because I think you're probably the most familiar with these facilities. Could you discuss what actually takes place in, in those facilities and the assault, the attacks that they've been under recently? Absolutely. The pro-life movement stands behind and supports women, um, including with, uh, with a network of 3,000 plus pregnancy resource centers. We support women at any cost with a range of services, including um, pregnancy tests, uh, counseling, diapers, material resources like baby formula, um, all kinds of different material resources, uh, baby clothing, training, um, relationship counseling, whatever a woman needs, uh, frequently housing even, whatever a woman needs, the center is there to either give her that resource, give her that care and support and counseling. The time of the gentleman has expired. Mr. Johnson of Georgia. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Uh, Professor Murray, well, I'll say that the United States Supreme Court's drastic and draconian edict to overturn Roe betrayed its guiding principles and exacted a terrible price on its legitimacy. Only 25% of Americans say that they have confidence in this Supreme Court, and that was before the court overturned Roe. 
So to put it simply, this court is in a major crisis. Professor Murray, isn't it true that uh, the Dobbs decision, which snuffed out the reproductive freedom of women and put politicians in state legislatures in control of women's bodily autonomy, operates to relegate those women to second-class status? Uh, and if you believe that, why? Thank you, Representative Johnson. Um, it is true that the Dobbs opinion in withdrawing this fundamental right from women reduces them to second-class citizenship. Uh, the court acknowledged in Planned Parenthood versus Casey, the 1992 decision that reaffirms the right to an abortion recognized in Roe, that the right to control one's reproductive capacity is essential to women's equality as equal citizens. And again, taking this right away limits the ability of women to control their destinies. Um, it is a right that was recognized in the 14th Amendment, the control over procreation, which had been denied enslaved women. It was recognized in the 14th Amendment, and it has now been withdrawn by this court. Thank you. And it's a fact, isn't it, that um, the majority's reasoning in Dobbs, uh, really the, the dissent or, or the concurring opinion of Justice Thomas implicates a plethora of other rights recognized under the 14th Amendment, uh, liberty and privacy guarantees. Uh, it implicates or it indicates or it tells us that the court, uh, that we're, those rights are in jeopardy uh, that um, uh, Justice Thomas cited uh, in his um, concurring opinion. Uh, even uh, the right against forced sterilization is found in Skinner versus Oklahoma. Would you agree? Yes, uh, that is exactly right. Justice Thomas's concurrence invites challenges to the long line of substantive due process cases, which begin in 1923 with Meyer versus Nebraska's recognition of the right of parental autonomy and go all the way forward to 2015's Obergefell versus Hodges, which recognizes same-sex marriage. And those rights include uh, those 14th Amendment due process, uh, privacy and liberty guarantees implicate uh, the decision in Loving versus Virginia. Would you explain that? And would you give me some explanation of why Justice Thomas would exclude a court review of that due process right uh, in his concurrent opinion? Well, I agree it is a curious omission. Um, the right to marry the person of one's choice as the court recognized in 1967's Loving versus Virginia is part of the essential civil rights of man. The court said that in its decision. Um, it also decides the decision on equality grounds, noting that Virginia's Racial Integrity Act of 1927 proceeded from an interest in enshrining white supremacy. So it struck it down on both equal protection grounds, but also noted that there were significant due process concerns because marriage is a fundamental right. So I am confused as to why it was not included in Justice Thomas's um, long laundry list of rights to be overturned, but it surely would be there. Well, could it be that he himself enjoys that right uh, conferred under loving? Well, it would not be the first time that someone offered um, freedom for me, but not for thee. That's pretty hypocritical. Uh, Professor Murray, uh, what threat does the Dobbs decision pose to access to contraception and other reproductive health care? Um, I think the right, the threat to contraception is quite imminent. Um, in footnote 41 of the Dobbs opinion, the court attempts to link the right to contraception to eugenics and racial genocide. I think there's no reason to include that in this opinion, um, given the other reasons the court has for overruling Roe versus Wade. So I speculate that the reason that very curious footnote is included is to seed the ground for associating the right to contraception with racial injustice so that it may be struck down in the future. Well, I thank you and I thank the witnesses for their testimony and their time today. And with that, I yield back. Gentleman yields back. I just wanted to uh, uh, mention to the members and, uh, and uh, witnesses, I said I'm gonna have a very strict gavel. A light tap will be a 15 second warning. Uh, Ms. Fishback. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, for nearly five decades, the American people were stripped of their ability to decide on the issue of abortion through elections and elected officials. And over 60 million unborn babies paid the price. 
Roe versus Wade was unconsti unconstitutionally imposed abortion policy on the American people, legislated by unelected judges that left Americans with no voice. Now this Supreme Court gave the decision back to the states and the American citizens. In case we have forgotten, this is what democracy looks like. Elected leaders accountable to the people they represent, they propose, debate, and pass laws that people support. Justice Alito explicitly stated in the majority opinion that the opinion only impacts abortion, arguing that abortion is fundamentally different from the other privacy issues like contraceptive and marriage because it destroys the life of a human being. The left wants you to believe that Republicans are extremists, when the fact is the majority of Americans agree there should be some restrictions on abortion. Americans do not support abortion on demand through all nine months of pregnancy. This is especially true when they learn all the scientific facts that have come out since Roe, the Roe decision was put down. My colleagues seem to be conveniently ignoring this information. Thanks to advances in science and modern medicine, the humanity of the unborn child is undeniable. At six weeks, an unborn child has a beating heart and facial features that begin to form. And by 15 weeks, unborn children's major organs are functioning, they can suck their thumb, they have fully formed noses, lips, eyes, and eyebrows, and they have facial expressions, and they are capable of feeling pain. Upon knowing this, it makes sense that the majority of Americans support some sorts of limits. Despite these facts, the left is proposing legislation that goes even further than Roe did. They want abortion on demand up until birth with no exceptions, no regulations, no limits. This is extreme. The left also wants to paint the pro-lifers as people who do not care about the health of the mother. This is fundamentally untrue. Pro-lifers care about the mother and the child, the unborn child and the mother. For decades, we have cared about the mothers, providing them with resources necessary for them to choose life, caring for the mother and the child. There are over 27, and maybe I should be corrected, over 3,000 pro-life pregnancy centers across the country that stand ready to be there for the expectant mother, regardless of their circumstances. My colleagues on the left are full of scare tactics about what this country will look like now that Dobbs has been decided and that Roe is no longer the law of the land. We cannot let their fear-mongering and their inflammatory language pull us away from reality. The reality is Roe has been overturned and the abortion policy has been put back in the hands of state's elected officials where it should be. And I would like to yield the rest of my time to Ms. Foster. I believe there was a question that you wanted to answer, that you were cut off. Yes, the pro-life movement supports women at all costs. We support them with this network of thousands of pregnancy care centers that outnumber abortion facilities five to one in our nation. They're in communities throughout our nation, not just in, you know, in the big cities where, um, where the abortion businesses uh, seem to target, um, but we are throughout our nation, and we're providing women with all kinds of resources, the financial resources, the housing resources, the material resources, the needs for their babies, and the needs for postpartum care, and the needs for you know relationship and job training going forward so that they can live a full and fulfilling life and they can thrive in whatever they choose to do. So I am just so incredibly proud to serve on the board of a pregnancy center, to support pregnancy centers with my time, talent, and treasure. And women deserve better than abortion. Uh, we deserve care. We deserve support. And that is exactly what pregnancy centers offer. Thank you very much. And I would just like to add that uh, while the pregnancy care centers are doing their work with volunteers and raising money to do that, the abortion industry is a $1.6 billion industry, and that's what the Democrats are protecting. Thank you very much. I yield back my time. The gentlelady yields back. Uh, Mr. Cohen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. First, I'd like to ask Ms. Murphy a few questions. It's been gone over pretty much, but I'd like to get into the legal distinctions of Griswold and Roe versus Oberfield 
and uh, Loving. Uh, were two of those cases decided only on substantive due process and the other two both substantial due process and equal protection? Um, that is correct, Representative Cohen. So if that's correct, and I thought it was, and I appreciate your, your clarifying for me, how, how could one distinguish the this case on gay marriage from the case on interracial marriage? Is there any way to distinguish it at all, legally? To my mind, there is no way to distinguish the two. Um, both of them acknowledge that there is a right to marry or not, and that implicit in that right is the right to marry a person of one's choice. It was interesting to me when I saw such, uh, Clarence Thomas not mention loving, which of course uh, ended what was a, a, a archaic and, and, and abhorrent policy of telling people that you couldn't marry somebody of a different race. Uh, it certainly affected uh, Senator McConnell. It certainly affected Justice Thomas, uh, my good friend back in Memphis, the late Judge Sugarman, and so many others. Uh, the, the lady from uh, the minority side, is it Ms. Foster or Ms. Fletcher? Foster. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ms. Foster. You, you are a constitutional expert, as I understand it. Do you agree that uh, that Loving versus Virginia is indistinguishable from Oberfeld? And if, if, if taken up, and just Justice Clarence Thomas suggested that it could be and probably would be struck down by this court? You know, I'm a constitutional attorney specializing in bioethics, not in marriage. Um, but I would point out that in Loving, uh, that decision was based on equal protection with about two paragraphs on substantive due process. Uh, Obergefell was based on both equal protection and substantive due process woven together in Justice Kennedy's opinion. Um, but, um, but I would simply say that, um, that when it comes to, um, to those cases, uh, unlike Roe and Casey, we haven't seen a court challenge uh, since those cases as opposed to Roe and Casey where we saw a Supreme Court case on abortion uh, on average every two, two and a half years or so ever since those Ms. cases Foster, came I'll, down. We have, Ms. Foster, thank you. I just do want to say this, that even though there were just two paragraphs, they are the same, they're similar. And I would suggest in your expertise, if you specialize in ethics, I think that when the right to marry the person of your choice is at risk and is only held up by a thin thread between two paragraphs and a few more paragraphs, that that should include your subject matter of ethics and the law and the court, because there's nothing more unethical than the court and the United States saying you cannot marry the person you want to because of race or because of gender. Uh, Ms. Ms. Fishback had a, a nice argument about the child at six weeks and the child at 15 weeks. She sounded much like Justice Roberts, who kind of said the same thing uh, and said we should not repeal Roe v. Wade, uh, but we should uphold the Mississippi law, which was the 15-week ban. But Justice Roberts was outvoted by his five more radical uh, members of the court who took the Federal Society's pledge to go to the court and get rid of uh, Roe v. Wade, and they did their instructions. They were Pavlovian, and they responded, and, and that has hurt American women. Someone earlier said, and I hate to think this, because I love America. I'm an American and, and, and love America and love this country, and I think it's a great country. But they said we're the freest country in the world. Uh, I think it was Ms. Foster. Well, right now, Canada's the freest country in the world, and there are a few other countries along with Canada that are more free than America when we've cut women away from having the opportunity to get uh, their families and their bodies to be their choices. The whole idea, though, of it being just not outlawed, but going back to the states is a red herring. The fact is, in the hardcore red states of the Southeast, uh, one time known as the Confederacy, there is but one or two states that would not ban abortion entirely. And those states did not offer many votes for the civil rights laws. They were passed by Congress without many votes from those red states and even the red states outside of the Confederacy. So we have to be concerned. You know, the idea of the states having power was not because we were the states were concerned about a oppressive government or because of abortion. It was because of slavery and slavery was wrong and outlawing abortion is wrong and outlawing gay marriage is wrong. I yield back the balance of my time. Gentleman yields back, Mr. Johnson of Louisiana. Mr. Cohen is wrong. Canada's not the most free country in the world, young people. 
America is the greatest nation in the world. We are the most free, most successful, most powerful nation because finally now we have been, we've tried to live up to the ideals articulated in the Declaration of Independence. And finally now the Supreme Court, after 50 years, nearly 50 years of an atrocity, <laughs> has brought us back to that hand. truth. Brought us back Would to that truth. It's my time. I will not yield, Mr. Free. Cohen, because your, your, your comments are absurd. The, this hearing is your absurd. Your comments are absurd. The, this You're hearing, absurd. It, 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 it's Mr. Johnson's time, Mr. Cohen. Thank you. This hearing is absurd. The Democrat majority has called us here for this hearing entitled The Threat to Individual Freedoms in a Post-Roe World. Come on. The first inalienable individual freedom is the right to be born. It's the right to life. We boldly declared that in our nation's birth certificate. America should continue to uphold the sanctity of human life. And state and local and federal government officials have a duty, a constitutional responsibility to protect that fundamental right. All life is precious, and there is an inherent compelling interest in protecting unborn children because they are unable to protect themselves. But the radical advocates of abortion are now completely unhinged, and they are seeking to trample on the individual freedoms of all those who disagree with them. Over the weekend, the left-wing activist group Shut Down DC offered $200 bounties for public sightings of Supreme Court justices they disagree with. It's obvious. The point of their tweet and, and all the attention they were trying to gather there is to get people to harass conservative justices when they're out in public. They don't have any individual freedoms. Hey, man, they're fair game. Then, then Senator Elizabeth Warren, I mean, she is completely unhinged now. She said pro-life pregnancy centers should be shut down all around the country. It's, it's, it's appalling for her to say that. Um, th there are 2,700 pregnancy centers all around this country, all 50 states. They're supported by over 10,000 licensed medical professionals, they annually serve approximately two million women and men. I was legal counsel for many of these pregnancy centers. I can tell you from my own experience, they do exceptional, critical work. Why would anybody wanna shut down pregnancy centers that exist to provide counseling, care, aid, and comfort to struggling mothers who just wanna have their babies? It defies logic, but the answer is simple. Their extreme agenda demands it. And speaking of extreme agendas, let me tell you what my friends on the other side of the aisle are for, okay? They, they filed a H.R. 8296 in this Congress. They, they call it the Women's Health Protection Act of 2022. We call it the Abortion on Demand Until Birth Act. You, want, you don't know why? Because it's extreme. It would create a national standard to allow for abortions for unborn children for any reason at any stage of pregnancy up until birth. Read the bill. That's not a talking point. It, it allows for discriminatory abortions on the basis of the baby's sex, race, and disability. It would override pro-life laws and prohibit states from enacting legislation that protects unborn children, such as protections for babies with Down syndrome and other disabilities. It removes common sense protections for women and children. For example, the Abortion on Demand Until Birth Act, the Democrats' bill, would not allow states to enact laws to ensure parental involvement for minors. Laws to protect women folk from coercion. They don't care, the agenda demands, the zeal for this demands that they override all that. Their bill includes vague, lang vague language that could also weaken conscience protections for medical professionals and limit their right to refuse to participate in an abortion. You think that they're not all on board for this? Guess what? On September 24th of last year, all but one Democrat in the House of Representatives voted on an almost identical bill. Go look it up, H.R. 3755. Abortion on demand until birth. That's what this agenda demands. Ms. Foster said it so well earlier. You mentioned this agenda begins with dehumanizing the unborn child. I just have a minute left, but in my experience, my colleagues here are not able to acknowledge that what is inside the mother's womb is actually a child. In, in your work and your experience, has that been yours as well? It has been. And, and it, there's a reason, I think, that they won't acknowledge that it's a child, because then it allows them to pursue this radical abortion on demand until birth. If we, I believe, and this is for all the young people here and those watching, I believe if you can, in this debate, if you can take people to the medical reality of the humanity of the unborn child, we win. This is a pro-life country, increasingly so, because we have medical technology, we have 4D ultrasounds. No one can lie to us anymore and tell us it's a blob of tissue, that, it, that it's just a clump of cells. This is a baby. At six weeks, it has a heartbeat. At 15 weeks, it can feel pain, suck its thumb, it has eyebrows, uh, lips, nose, and the whole thing. Look at the reality, folks. Do not be, do not let them obscure the facts. We're a pro-life country, we should be. I'm out of time, I yield back. Gentlemen, yields back, Ms. Jackson Lee. 
I thank the gentleman very much, and since we're in the middle of a tutorial, let me speak from the heart. Speak from the years of service on this committee, years of knowledge, of ruined lives with criminal approaches to trying to before Roe to help persons, women, make their determination on their reproductive freedom. This is an absurd posture that is being taken here. I respect the religious beliefs of all, and I respect that there are differences in this nation. It is an outrage what is going on here in the United States because it is clearly evidence that we are in trouble. The Ninth Amendment is clear, along with the other protections, that if it is not enumerated, it still does not deny me my right to privacy, my right to marry who I want to marry, my right for once in, in life to be able to assure uh, that uh, I can marry someone of a different race. You know what states' rights are? Hanging black people. You know what states' rights are? The denial of civil rights. That's what states' rights can be. Leave it to the elected persons of the state. If they had done that, I would still be a second-class citizen. It took the 13th Amendment to say that slavery was illegal. So let me first of all say, we know that in Ohio, a 10-year-old rape victim was denied an abortion and forced to travel across state lines to access care. We know that a package was left at a woman's health, clear, health clinic in Austin, Texas, an explosive device went off. We know that uh, a Planned Parenthood clinic in Columbus was vandalized, Satan den of baby killers. Uh, we know that in Baltimore, a abortion uh, provider, health provider, healthcare clinic with anti-abortion graffiti was attacked. A Planned Parenthood clinic at Claremont, New York was vandalized by a juvenile an unidentified person deliberately set fire to a Planned Parenthood clinic. We can go on and on and on. Is that America? I don't think so. Professor Mary, help me understand because I have always had the greatest admiration for the legal uh, prominence of the Supreme Court. And I want to have you expand on these words very quickly as my time runs out. Uh, Justice Gorsuch said in confirmation hearings, it has been reaffirmed. A good judge will consider it as precedent. This is reference to Roe v. Wade of the U.S. Supreme Court, worthy as treatment of precedent like any other. Brett Kavanaugh, uh, regarding Roe v. Wade, it is, as, it is settled as a precedent of the Supreme Court entitled the respect under principles of stare decisis. And then Amy Coney Barrett, I will obey all rules of stare decisis that if a question comes up before me about whether case or any other case should be overruled, that I will follow the law of stare decisive, applying it as the court is articulating, applying to all factors. Professor Murray, trying to see where you are. There you are. Good to see you. What does that do in imploding, imploding the American concept of justice and the role of the Supreme Court that has now caused the clashes of American people, one at each other, because the refuge that we look for in civil rights, in marriage, uh, and who to marriage, in the defense of marriage, is no longer there. Professor Murray? Uh, you're exactly right, Representative Lee. Uh, this principle of stare decisis that the court follows settled precedent, and indeed Roe is a settled precedent. It has repeatedly been reaffirmed until it was overruled on June 24th. That provides predictability for individuals, the assurance that they know that their rights are protected. I think part of the outrage that you are describing is because people in this country recognize that this decision was upheld for almost 50 years. And the only thing that has changed since those 50 years has been the composition of this court and the installation of a six to three conservative supermajority. What does it say about confirmation hearings when uh, uh, judges are under oath? I mean, again, these judges promised to follow precedent and it is clear that they did not. And if the confirmation hearings are to assure the American people about a judicial philosophy, I think the American people have been hoodwinked. 
I thank you. We need to expand the court. With that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. General Lady yields back. Mr. Gates. I'm sorry, Mr. Issa. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Foster, uh, are you familiar with the proposal by the majority to pack the Supreme Court with additional justices to get the outcome they want? I am. Are you familiar with uh, a little more esoteric, H.R. 4886, the Circuit Court uh, ju uh, Judgeship Act? Yes. Which would add 203 additional federal judges selected by the president and the Democrat majority in the Senate at this time. So it is interesting to me that everyone seems to be so interested in, in this court making a decision that it looks like they're, uh, they're, they're, they're ready to simply choose some additional people to make the opposite decision. Is that the politicization of the court in a way that we have never seen it before? It certainly is, and that is exactly what Justice Alito repudiated for the court in his majority opinion in Dobbs. And looking at Dobbs for a moment, uh, it certainly uh, does undo uh, previous decisions of the court. Is that unheard of for the court uh, decades later to reconsider decisions uh, in light of some change, not just in the court, but in the times? It certainly is not unheard of. In fact, just two days ago, there was a hearing in the Senate in which one of the senators uh, was talking about the Janus case just a couple of years ago. There have been numerous other cases that, um, that follow those, those same lines. Well, <laughs> Let, let's, since uh, Ms. Sheila Jackson Lee was, was up before us and, and seemed to be so certain that you should never, never, never uh, overturn precedent and that these people lied, what would happen if Dred Scott were still in place today? No, I will go there because freedom is what we're discussing. In this case, freedom to live for the unborn. What would happen? What would happen if we simply said, once the court makes a decision, it can never yield. change its mind? Would the gentleman There's, yield? Of course not. <laughs> There's a reason why there are certain factors that the justices examine when going through stare decisis analysis. And if those factors um, are met, then a case may be ripe for reconsideration. Um, you know, obviously we do have stare decisis for a reason, but we follow precedent because it's correct and right and constitutional, not just because, you know, a few robed men wrote some words down on paper, you know, a few decades ago. Well, let's, let's, let's go into the, the, the decision that was overturned. Is it fair to say that the previous decisions, including Roe, basically said that the, the unborn child had no rights, that all the rights up until, in the case of California and many other states, birth, uh, belonged to the mother and the mother exclusively. With that, that's a, that was essentially the law of the land federally guaranteed. Yes. And by overturning it, does that inherently give any rights to the unborn child? It does not. So. As we speak here today, we've simply taken away the denial of all rights of a child and left to the states the opportunity to balance the rights of an unborn child, viable and able to feel pain, viable and able to be born alive. Is that right? That's right, and that's the balance that the court attempted to and failed to strike in both Roe and Casey. This court has achieved it. Now, isn't one of the, the inherent flaws in Roe and Casey that what they did was they were only given rights to the mother and they never recognized the right of the living child inside the womb. Correct. Now, I'm a Californian, so I, I know that my, my speaker, uh, uh, Speaker Pelosi, and that my state considers that a child already outside the womb still doesn't have rights in my state because we still are e effectively a partial birth abortion state. So. The question I think for all of us here today is, do we trust the legislatures of the state to give rights to the unborn child or the nearly born child or the chest born child? Uh, or should we in fact be sitting here, instead of discussing how to codify abortion up to the date of, of birth, should we be talking about the rights of respect for life, the respect for that child? 
Is that what you would prefer we do here today? It certainly is. We should be talking about <coughs> protection, respect, dignity, and equal rights for all human beings. And I will close by simply saying the chairman of this committee, when, when I first came to Congress, Chairman Hyde, would be having that discussion if he, he were here alive today. He would be talking about respect for life, and I yield back. Gentleman yields back, Mr. Cicilline. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. On June 24th, the Supreme Court's radical conservative majority made clear that they were not only gutting 50 years of women's established constitutional rights to make their own reproductive decisions, but that abortion was just the first on the laundry list of rights that they were prepared to eviscerate. The right to privacy and intimate relations, the right to raise your children how you see fit, the right to contraception, the right to same-sex marriage. And when people talk about the radical advocates, as my colleagues on the other side of the aisle have described, I am a radical advocate for personal freedom and individual liberty. And our democracy is premised on a notion of basic individual autonomy. We don't let states or even the federal government take away rights that the Constitution establishes. And so it's not a question of do we trust states to do it, it's do we trust the individual, and in this case it's women, to make their own health care decisions. But it's astonishing to me that anyone who has read this decision is not worried about many other rights that are at issue and that are in danger. Regardless of what your political party is, regardless of what your view is on abortion, there are lots and lots of rights that are also at risk. And so I hope all of America is paying attention to this decision because your rights, well-established freedoms, are hanging in the balance. And that brings me to my first question. Ms. Werbelov, thank you for your incredible work, for your testimony. And thank you, Mr. Oberfeld, for your really compelling testimony, for your courage and bravery in helping to bring marriage equality to millions and millions of people in this country. Um, you know, if you look at Justice Alito's uh, adherence to a legal philosophy known as original intent, which involves examining the founding documents language to derive meaning on contemporary issues, can you explain why this method of legal reasoning is outdated and antithetical to a modern society, particularly to members of the LGBTQ community who has historically been discriminated against, and if you follow that reasoning, may never live in a country where they can live lives free of discrimination? And finally, would the Equality Act address that? You know, first, it's important to note that it's very difficult to discern original intent. We cannot always know what is in the mind of a legislator when they pass a law. Um, and in fact, people may have conflicting reasons for passing a law. Um, that's why, uh, basing on original intent, whether it's a piece of legislation uh, or a constitutional amendment, is a flawed approach uh, to legal analysis. Beyond that, um, it, taking that approach uh, continues to privilege those with power. Um, and individuals, LGBTQ people, uh, people of color, particularly black and brown people, people with disabilities, um, and women will continue to be disadvantaged if we are always taking into account what was written uh, you know, at more than two centuries ago um, by white men who were interested in maintaining control of society rather than sharing equality with all. Which as uh, Delia Lewis, I think so eloquently said, this move cynically weaponizes a deeply rooted history and tradition of little protected liberty and vast inequality to eradicate the modern jurisprudence of American liberty and equality, which is exactly what you just said. Uh, Professor Murray, uh, under Roe and Casey, the right to abortion was implicitly read into the 14th Amendment due process clause and obviously was deemed a fundamental right. In Dobbs, Justice Alito rejects this approach, um, reasoning again that only rights that are deeply rooted in the nation's history and tradition and implicit in the concept of ordered liberty are fundamental rights. Again, what are the implications of adhering to this logic for other rights? And specifically, what would the impact be in addition to that on in vitro fertilization if state abortion laws are interpreted as granting fertilized human eggs legal rights and protections? Thank you for the question. Um, let me reiterate, uh, the right to choose your, your, your procreative future is not just implicit in the guarantee of liberty, it was actually explicit in the 14th Amendment's ratifiers views of this anti-slavery amendment. So it proceeds from that ethic. And it does have important repercussions overruling the right contains in Roe. 
um, does have important repercussions for in vitro fertilization. As you know, um, part of the in vitro process often requires the selective um, elimination of embryos. And so there are lots of questions about whether or not this limitation on the right to procreate could have broad repercussions for assisted reproductive technology, including ART and IVF. Thank you. And Mr. Chairman, I would ask unanimous consent to induce in the record the United States Freedom in the World 2022 Country Report, because sadly, America is less free than it was just a few years ago. And so this isn't a question about what we think. This is a report that shows we've slipped. America is less free. The Supreme Court is attacking our freedoms. Yeah. We need to stand up and codify everything we can to protect all Americans so they can be free from discrimination of any kind and we recognize have, the autonomy of every single citizen. Without objection, and the time of the gentleman has expired, Mr. Gohmert. Thank you. Um, Ms. Foster, uh, I'm familiar with a lot of pregnancy centers in my district, uh, in my state. Uh, does your pregnancy center of care uh, that you're involved with, uh, does that care end when a child is born? It does not. What happens after that? After the child is born, the pregnancy center continues to be there for the woman, partner, family, uh, providing material resources such as baby clothes, baby formula, diapers, any other needs, um, providing training, parenting training, um, job skills training, a number of other resources, whatever the, the young woman, the young family needs, um, the pregnancy center is there for them. Well, it's such a contrast that you would care for the mother, care for the life of the child. Uh, such a contrast to what I learned multiple conversations with the former director of Planned Parenthood in Sherman, Texas, Ramona Trevino. Uh, she was bright and shining star in her high school, got pregnant, and then uh, was urged to have an abortion, didn't but she didn't go to college. And then uh, years later found that there was an opening for director of Planned Parenthood. She applied and was thrilled to have gotten the position, but she was very, very smart. Um, but during her time there, she said, you know, the emphasis was not, in their monthly director's meeting was not on the number of abortions even though that's where the huge money came from, but it was on how many young girls did you get started on birth control, and the younger the better, because they were taught through their directorship at Planned Parenthood that the younger you can get a girl started on birth control, the better the odds are that she'll forget to take the pill, she'll get pregnant, and then she'll have an abortion uh, they are nurtured, I'm using that very loosely, by people that worked at Planned Parenthood. Look, your mother is not going to understand. You come to me. Don't come to your mother. I'll understand. And they got that relationship. And what really ended up driving her away from all of that was the thought that they would come between me and my daughter. And that was too much. Now, we've been hearing my body, my choice from people for so long, and uh, that's true. It's also true of the child, but we had that fraud exposed when we heard from so many who've been screaming my body, my choice, as they screamed that everybody has to have an experimental drug which has caused great damage and death in people uh, alters the RNA, but you're going to have to have that injected into your body. I don't care what your biology is. So that was exposed as not really being as consistent, uh, actually coming into the fraud area. But let me tell you, we, we sat here in this room and listened to an abortionist talk about how he did the late-term abortion. And our daughter was born eight to 10 months premature, or weeks prematurely, rather. And back then, it was a big deal. She was, we didn't know if she'd live or not. And my wife had to stay at the hospital in Tyler. She encouraged me to follow the ambulance going to the 
higher level um, neonatal ICU. And the doctor there said, you know, she won't, she can't recognize your face because her eyes aren't working that well yet. She knows your voice. She's been listening to your voice for months. So talk to her. And, uh, and you know, it, touch her little face. And, you know, you can be there for two hours and take a break, come back. They had her hooked up to all these things and uh, her breathing was very erratic, very shallow, her heart very erratic, very fast. But eventually the doctor came over and said, have you noticed the monitors? They'd stabilize. He said, she's drawing strength and life from you. And the thought that anybody that cares about other people could want to have a child like that, have their arms and legs ripped off the and the head has crushed and pulled. Time of the gentleman has expired, Ms. Just Demings. an abomination. Thank you so back. much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you know, it's disappointing that here we are today in 2022 20, with all of the challenges that we are facing, still fighting the same old fight for individual rights, but here we are, and that is a fight that we will continue to fight and should be fighting. Why is it so easy to call the vicious rape of a 10-year-old girl a hoax, a lie, a political stunt? Police certainly didn't think so when they made their arrests. Why is it so easy for some to always say assault against women? It must be the woman's fault for decades. Victims of rape are always questioned, viewed with suspicion, too frequently questioned and viewed with suspicion, um, or even questioned that perhaps somehow she brought the tragedy on herself. Why was she there? How was she dressed? Did she want it? I've investigated cases of rape and sexual assault and incest. How can we sit here today, are we serious, and say regardless of the physical, emotional, and psychological trauma of women and girls who survive these vicious attacks, that does not matter. That the only thing that matters is denying them their individual constitutional rights. Are we really serious? The only thing that matters is treating them with all of the work that has been done in this country by people who pave the way, the efforts to continue to treat women and girls like property and like second-class citizens. To say that you have to go to your member of Congress or your governor or your senator and ask for permission. Come on, America. You know, Charlie Chisholm said, the sexual, psychological stereotyping of females begins when the doctor says, it's a girl. And my colleagues on the other side of the aisle have the audacity to say freedom is what we are discussing here, you're damn right. That's exactly what we are discussing here, individual freedoms. I mean, who do we think we are to tell people how to live their lives? To every family raising daughters, to my four granddaughters, we all have reason, regardless of your political, come on America, regardless of your political Standing, we all have reason to be very concerned. What's next? We, we ought to be asking ourselves, okay, what's next? If you think it stops here, where there's already been an indication that it does not uh, stop here with the call, the bold call to look at Griswold and Lawrence and even Marrying the person that you love. I thought that was an American tradition, but I guess not in the minds of some. Professor Murray, I just want you to just, if you would, reiterate on not just the issue of 
row, because that's pretty doggone important to me, and I would think to every man and woman, it should be raising a girl, a daughter, but would you just kind of go into why should we all be concerned about other constitutional individual rights, rights to privacy being trampled upon? Certainly. Thank you, Representative Demings. Um, I think we should all be concerned about the prospect of fundamental rights being overruled and returned to the states for democratic deliberation. To ask the states to decide our most essential freedoms is essentially to make all of us supplicants to the government. That cannot be what the framers of the Constitution imagined. These were gentlemen who were concerned about the prospect of government overreach into individual lives. These were people who wrote the Third Amendment, which protects against the quartering of soldiers in your home. I cannot imagine that the framers would countenance allowing the government to make the most intimate decisions for individuals rather than allowing individuals to make those decisions for themselves. And that's exactly what this decision and its progeny will do. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. I yield back. General Lady yields back, Mr. Gates. Ms. Warblow, what's the most likely circumstance when a same-sex couple would benefit from abortion access? Um, unfortunately, we have women um, who experience sexual assault. Um, in fact, uh, lesbian and bisexual women are more likely to experience sexual assault than heterosexual women, um, that their pregnancies are often involuntary. Um, and so these are individuals who would need access to abortion care. And, and we'll shelve the bisexual women for a moment since my question's about the same-sex couples. And what's more likely, a lesbian woman having an unwanted pregnancy as the consequence of a sexual assault or a gay couple adopting in America? Mm -hmm. These are both laudable goals. No, I didn't ask, well, I know they are. Which is more likely? I think that's uh, impossible to know whether or not. Well, we have tens of thousands of same-sex couples that are raising families and uh, raising children as a consequence of adoption. Tens of thousands, we know that uh, as a consequence of census data. So is there any data you're able to reference that it would be more likely for a lesbian woman to have an unwanted pregnancy as a consequence of rape than the formation of a family through a same-sex couple adopting? It may not be more likely, but it's an important it's, it, interest. Is it, is it less likely? No, no, no. Who I'm not asking about the importance of the interest because I'm very limited on time. It. The question is, it's cert you would concede that it's certainly more, that it's more likely in America that you have same-sex couples adopting than you do lesbians having unwanted pregnancies as a consequence of sexual assault, right? Well, there may be also be a misunderstanding about how uh, same-sex couples form families. I also think it's important to note that many bisexual women are, in fact, in relationships with other women. Yeah, so I, I, I maybe said, a misunderstanding yeah, I, there. Yeah, well, but but, um, uh, but if a woman is with men and women, they're bisexual, right? That is not true, sir. Um, an individual who is retracted to people of both sexes, both men and fe uh, male and female, is someone who's bisexual. They can be in long-term monogamous relationships. I don't ask this to be dismissive, but so are you saying lesbian women are also capable of being into men? That is not what I said. I said bisexual. Yeah, but my question is about lesbian, same-sex couples, right? Because I, I care about this issue deeply. With the support of the Human Rights Campaign, I sponsored the legislation to get rid of the statutory prohibition on gay adoption in Florida. I felt that, that was very bigoted. And I believe families are defined by love more than blood. And I worry that if the LGBTQ community and if the advocacy organizations for same-sex couples somehow reorients to be a pro-abortion enterprise, that that could actually result in fewer same-sex couples having access to the family formation that, that gives them fulfilled lives. Are you concerned about that? What I would be concerned about is forcing women to carry a pregnancy simply to satisfy another couple's desire to have a child. There are many methods of family formation. Many same-sex couples use fertility treatments, uh, assisted reproductive technologies, in addition to adoption. Um, and in fact, uh, LGBTQ people are more likely to adopt children who are most in need. Three Kids times more likely. Out of yeah. foster no, care. I, I, I've noted that, that, that actually same-sex couples are three times more likely than opposite-sex couples to adopt in America. And that's why it's astonishing to me that people that would, that would purport to advocate for gay Americans would say what we need is abortion on demand because it's these very people who are engaging in, in these adoptions. And maybe it's really not about the benefit of gay couples. Maybe it's about the money. 
I mean, you know, because Ms. Foster, you made reference to how much money is behind the pro-abortion effort in America, and do you worry that organizations like the Human Rights Campaign that traditionally have stood up for the interests and families of gay couples, same-sex couples, might be co-opted by the coercive and dangerous money that is just for abortion at all costs? Planned Parenthood receives half a billion taxpayer dollars every single year, and I think that a lot of that Maybe all of it should go towards actually planning parenthood. Yeah, adoption is a beautiful thing. It really is a beautiful thing. And this, this desire to have these reflexive snap abortions seems to stand in the way of that. Another uh, element of your testimony, Ms. Warblow, you said that states were, re -likely, were likely to redouble their efforts against marriage equality as a consequence of the Dobbs decision. But there isn't a single state in America where there's been a single legislative committee that has held a single vote on a single bill to attack marriage equality following Dobbs, has there? I'm sorry, sir, that is not, well, not following Dobbs, Dobbs just happened. Most right. state legislatures are not in session. However, But since Dobbs, there's not, that's never happened. There's the no real the threat the for marriage equality. That's an invention. The time of the threat. gentleman has expired, Mr. Jeffries. Uh, I thank the chair for convening this hearing and uh, witnesses for their presence. We are in the midst of uh, an extreme right-wing assault by an illegitimate Supreme Court majority on women's rights, reproductive rights, marital rights, family planning rights, civil rights, voting rights, labor rights, and the right to liberty and justice for all. An assault by an illegitimate Supreme Court majority and a right-wing movement here in this country determined to jam its values down the throats of the American people, and strip away liberty. It's interesting to me that, uh, Ms. Foster, I think you made the statement earlier that the people who support abortion care are extreme. Is that correct? Anyone who would support abortion up to the baby's birthday is extreme. Uh, I think what you've heard people within the pro-choice movement articulate is that we support a woman's freedom to make her own reproductive health care decisions. That's not extreme, that's mainstream. It's mainstream if you support the fact that this decision, reproductive decisions, should be between a woman and her doctor. We don't need Ted Cruz or anyone else involved in making that decision. That's, that's extreme, what you want to bring about. It's extreme to criminalize abortion care throughout America. That's extreme. What's extreme is imposing government-mandated pregnancies, even apparently in some states in the case of a 10-year-old girl being raped. That's extreme. That's extreme. It's extreme to unleash bounty hunters on the women and children of America. That's extreme. That's not pro-life. What's interesting is that the pro-life movement, often so-called movement, often says that we support the American family, so we, we, we support children. At the same time, these individuals vote against the child tax credit that reduced child poverty by more than 40% in America. That's not pro-family, that's anti-child. It's anti-child when you actually vote against a legislative effort to deal with the infant baby formula shortage in America. That's not pro-family, that's anti-child. It's anti-child when Republican governor after Republican governor in this country refused to expand access to Medicaid, which supports women and children. So spare us the lectures and the phony rhetoric about being pro-family. When in instance after instance after instance, you behave in an extreme way, that's anti-child. That's anti-family. Now, Professor Murray, you uh, 
are familiar with the fact that several Supreme Court justices during their Senate testimony seemed to strongly suggest that they viewed Roe v. Wade as settled law. Is that right? That's correct, Representative Jeffries. And several of those individuals who testified that Roe v. Wade was settled law, suggesting that they weren't going to touch it for a variety of reasons, stare decisis, the principle of reliance interest that is a big part of Supreme Court jurisprudence, then turned around the first chance they got and stripped away a woman's freedom to make her own reproductive health care decisions. Is that true? That's correct. And now these same justices, some of them, are suggesting we don't have to worry about stripping away the freedom of Americans to make their own decisions as to who they want to marry or how they should plan a family. Is that right? That is also correct. And is there any reason to believe that this illegitimate Supreme Court majority with members who clearly misrepresented their views before the United States Senate during sworn testimony should now be believed that they're not going after the substantive due process rights time that is the, the subject of this hearing. Time of the gentleman has expired, Mr. Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ms. Foster, is it extreme and an effort to intimidate the court when left-wing groups pay people who tell them where a Supreme Court justice is having dinner with his family? Is that extreme? Yes. Is it extreme when the court, for the first time in history, someone in the court leaks a draft opinion? Is that extreme and an effort to intimidate the court? Yes. Is it extreme when, and an effort to intimidate the court when the Speaker of the House holds up a bill for four weeks designed to protect giving protection to a Supreme Court justice's family who've had their kids' school put online, is that extreme? Yes. Is it extreme, is it extreme then when the Justice Department, key agency in the executive branch, fails to prosecute protesters, ignoring a statute that's directly on point when they're protesting at Supreme Court Justice's home in an effort to intimidate them and influence a decision, a, court, a case pending in front of the court. Is that extreme in an effort to intimidate the court? Yes. How about the 50, 50 incidents of, of in 10 weeks of pri crisis pregnancy centers and churches being attacked by left-wing activists, is that extreme and an effort to intimidate pro-life Americans around the country? Yes. Give us a lecture on extreme. You got to be kidding me. Uh, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. Uh, we noticed today that when you came in, you had a security detail with you. Is that true? Yes, that's correct. And this is the second time you've testified in front of our committee? It is. When, when, when you testified a few weeks ago. Uh, what date? Can you refresh me? I don't, I don't remember the date. It was May, three weeks ago, four weeks ago? Something like that, yeah. Maybe, maybe I guess it was two. Post-leak. Post-leak. So I think it was May, middle of May, you testified. Did you have security detail then? I did not. I did not have personal security detail at the time. Is there a reason you have them now then? There is. Um, I've had to employ both personal and office security because of the threats that I and my colleagues have received, um, similar to the threats that have been received and, in fact, carried out all across the country with those 50 attacks. So here's what I want Did you receive those threats after you testified? Yes. So that's when they started. You testified as a Republican witness, pro-life witness in front of this committee, then you started getting threats, and as a result, you now have to have security detail. Is that right? Ms. That's correct. So it's not just the, the pro-life clinics and churches, it's people who have the willingness to come forward and testify in a hearing in front of the United States Congress who also get, I mean, we all know, we, we, the left always talks about the threats they get, we all get these threats, it's terrible. Well, I, I wish no one, did. I don't want anyone to have these things. No matter what side of the political aisle you're on, we shouldn't have it, but all I know is in 10 weeks, we've had 50 happen to pro-life pro uh, uh, crisis pregnancy centers and to churches. Uh, Ms. Warbelow, do you agree with the leaking of the Dobbs opinion? I do not, but I do want to clarify that is not the first time um, that a Supreme Court opinion has been leaked, and we don't know who leaked the opinion or for what purpose. I didn't. I, I don't. I don't know. I, I don't pretend to know who leaked it. I'm just asking if you if you agree with the leak, because some someone on the left seemed to uh, agree with that. Um, Ms. Foster, um, 
This concerted effort by the left to engage in an effort to intimidate the court, I think, is, is dangerous, particularly when you have the legislative branch of government as evidenced by the actions taken by Speaker Pelosi in holding up that legislation, and the lack of efforts to enforce a statute, 18 U.S.C. Section 1507, by the executive branch, the Justice Department. When you have two branches of government looking to be a part of the left's effort to intimidate a separate and equal branch of government, I find that very troubling. And as someone who understands the, the Constitution, the Constitutional Scholar, give me your thoughts on that. I certainly agree that it's troubling. Um, the legislation that would protect Supreme Court justices should never be held up. No one should be subjected to violence, whether um, in their home, at their church, at their ministry, or in the womb. Yeah, well said, well said. And the idea that we had um, an assassination attempt on a sitting justice in, in, in America, as my colleague Mr. Johnson said, the freest, greatest country ever um, is, is just so wrong. But it's driven by, I think, the statements made by Senator Schumer on the steps of the Capitol when he talked about unleashing the whirlwind. We have certainly seen that play out in the last 10 weeks here in our great country, and that's, uh, that's unfortunate, and I hope it changes. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I would yield back. Gentleman yields back, Mr. Liu. Thank you, Chairman Adler. You're gonna hear a lot of words from my Republican colleagues today on this committee, and all I have to do is give you one example that is devastating to their statements, and that is this. A 10-year-old girl got raped in Ohio and got pregnant. She could not get an abortion because none of the exceptions in Ohio law would have authorized it. And what did MAGA Republicans do? They smeared her. They said she was lying. In fact, at least one Republican member of this committee publicly tweeted that she lied and then quietly deleted that tweet when, guess what? Her perpetrator was arrested. I call on any MAGA Republican who smeared this little girl to publicly apologize. But the story gets worse than that because this little girl had to go to Indiana to get an abortion or abortion care. And guess what MAGA Republicans are doing now? They're going after the doctor. That's right, the doctor who helped this little girl. Because the truth is, MAGA and far-right Republicans want government-mandated pregnancies for everyone, including 10-year-old rape victims. That is extreme. Now, let's go to the Supreme Court's radical Dobbs decision. And when you read it, it's very clear that multiple Supreme Court justices lied in order to get confirmed. You cannot square what the majority said in Dobbs with the statements by Justices Gorsuch and Kavanaugh. Now let's look what this opinion said. One of the reasons that they overturned Roe v. Wade is they said that the Constitution makes no reference to abortion. So Professor Murray, let me ask you this question. Does the Constitution make any reference to birth control pills? No, it does not. So under the Supreme Court's radical far-right opinion, they could give politicians the power to decide who can get birth control bills. Isn't that right? That is correct. Yeah. First, Murray, does the Constitution make any reference to condoms? No. So under the Supreme Court's radical opinion, these justices could give politicians the power to ban condoms. Isn't that right? It is possible, yes. Yeah. Uh, Legal Director Warbelow, question for you. Does the Constitution make any reference to gay marriage? It does not. My apologies, it does under not. The, under the Supreme Court's radical decision, they could give politicians the right to ban gay marriage. Isn't that right? Certainly, um, Justice Thomas invited those challenges and is welcoming the opportunity to revisit those questions uh, by the court. Thank you. Does the Constitution make any reference to interracial marriage? It does not. So under the Supreme Court's radical decision, they could certainly give politicians the right to decide whether or not to ban interracial marriage. Isn't that right? That is the invitation that has been made. You know what the Constitution does make reference to, by the way? A well-regulated militia. I hope the Supreme Court actually looks at that phrase and actually adheres to it. But that's another matter. So let's return now uh, to this issue. Under the Dobbs decision, 
the Supreme Court justices said that Roe was egregiously wrong from the start. That means Justices Gorsuch and Kavanaugh had to have known that during their confirmation hearings because Roe v. Wade was decided 50 years ago. Will the gentleman yield for exactly what the justices it, said no, during their confirmation hearing? Yeah, I didn't think so. Did any of them, did any of them say Roe v. Wade was egregiously wrong from the start? No, they didn't. In fact, they said the opposite. You know, they could have done what Justice Thomas did, which was really not talk about it. They could have said, I'm not going to talk about Roe v. Wade. They could say, I'm not going to answer your question. But that is not what Justice Kavanaugh did. He went above and beyond to intentionally mislead the American people. He even went and talked about Casey. You know what he said about Casey? He said, you know, Casey is precedent on top of precedent. He was trying to give assurances to U.S. Senate and the American public that he was not going to overturn Roe v. Wade. Same with Justice Gorsuch. They didn't have to do that. Right? They could have done what other justices did. They could have given themselves wiggle room, be silent, say, I'm not going to answer the question. But they didn't. They lied. They specifically lied to the American people and to the U.S. Senate. And that's why Alexandria Ocasio Cortez and I have written a letter to the U.S. Senate asking them to make a finding on whether Justice Gorsuch and Kavanaugh lied to the American people. I yield back. Mr. Mr. Chairman, those Chairman, words should be struck. You cannot accuse the, the Supreme uh, Court justice of lying. The time of the gentleman has expired, Mr. Buck. Mr. Buck. Mr. Chairman, I have a point of order. The gentleman will state his point of order. Can a member of this committee accuse a Supreme Court justice of lying under oath without evidence? Uh, that's, yes. that's acceptable yes. under the rules? The rules okay. Yes. All right. The, so, rule, the rules of... The rules against per, the rules on personalities, which apply to other members, which apply to other members of the house, do not apply to anyone outside the house. How unfortunate for them! I, I have unanimous consent to enter into the record the exact quotations of what these Without five objection. justices said. Without Thank objection, you in their Mr. Buck. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In the early morning of June 26 of this year, the Life Choices Center in my district was attacked and a fire was started inside. On the outside wall, the arsonist spray painted, if abortions aren't safe, neither are you. According to its website, Life Choices is a Christ-centered ministry that offers free services related to pregnancy and sexual health, information on reversing the effects of abortion pills and post-abortion support for guilt, shame, anxiety, and depression. The radical left today is more violent than ever, with more than 50 attacks on pro-life pregnancy centers and churches since May. Rather than putting a stop to the violence, the Biden administration and its Department of Justice refuse to condemn it and are even suggesting it is abortionists that are under attack and in need of protection. This is far from the first time the left has used violence in their push to incite a progressive revolution in America. From the assassination attempt on Justice Brett Kavanaugh to growing attacks from Black Lives Matter and Antifa on the back of mass riots, vandalism, and arson in 2020, the left has all too often chosen violence with elected Democrats and pundits all too happy to run for cover for the extremists in their own ranks. As Jane's Revenge, a leftist group that took credit for firebombing pregnancy centers in Wisconsin, New York, and Oregon said, it's open season on America's pro-life institutions with other groups even putting bounties on conservative Supreme Court justices. Meanwhile, DOJ continues to target conservatives, <clears throat> including nine pro-life activists in February for protesting in front of an abortion clinic, something normally treated as nuisance trespass, but which is being treated as a serious felony for those protesters. My friends across the aisle seem to think they can bend reality to their own whims if they only repeat the same radical talking points long enough. In the meantime, the rule of law and pro-life Americans' constitutional rights to freedom of speech and religion are under attack. Americans deserve better. The progressive driving this violence, the progressives driving this violence, and the national politicians and media outlets egging it on threaten all of us. In 2020, rioters caused more than a billion dollars in damage, and more than 20 people lost their lives. So far, we've been lucky. But if this keeps up, someone is going to lose their life. And God forbid, when that happens, the Democrats running for cover will have no one to blame but themselves. 
Ms. Foster, I served on the board of the Northern Colorado Genesis Project. It's a nonprofit agency that provides uh, uh, care, counseling, uh, financial support, housing uh, for uh, pregnant women. How many women and children are served every year by pregnancy resource and crisis centers in this country? Many millions. And, and what kind of care do they receive? All kinds of care, material support, resources, training, um, housing if needed, um, diapers, clothes, formula, you name it. If the woman is in need of it, you know, 76% of women say that they would choose to parent if their circumstances were different. So this hearing should be about making those circumstances different, helping them improve their circumstances and find a fulfilling life. And in, in, in that same statistic, I would assume, includes adoption, the ability for uh, a, a, a woman to make a choice about having a baby and then giving that baby to a family that can't have children. Actually, it doesn't. That would be above and beyond the 76%. Great. Um, and, and so some of these are uh, religious institutions and some are not. Is that true? That's true, yes. And, and the, uh, the secular uh, institutions, um, uh, did they receive taxpayer uh, funding at all for their services? The vast majority of pregnancy centers are entirely volunteer, are funded by donations. How does the violence that we have seen recently in this country impact the services to women who, and, and some of them may still choose to have an abortion, but they're at least going to ask the question and try to gain information to make an informed decision. How does the violence impact the women and, and the, the services that are being provided to those women? Yeah, at least they find out what resources are available for them. Actually, um, a couple of days ago, I was privileged to go visit one of those pregnancy centers uh, here in D.C. that was tragically vandalized, and, um, and they were sharing that they had had to hire security. Um, they were spending donor funds on security instead of just being able to, to give all that money to the women who, who really need the care and the support. How does the Biden administration's lack of support impact that? <laughs> Um, they need they need funding. They need more ability to to get to those women. The time of the gentleman has expired, Ms. Jayapal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I find it stunning that we are being lectured on what violence is and what extremism is extremism is by colleagues who, some of whom have fueled that very violence by not condemning the January sixth insurrection by defending and potentially even, according to the January 6th committee hearings, potentially even being involved in that insurrection, that violent coup to overturn our democracy. Let me go to the matter at hand, which is the horrendous revocation of human rights that have caused people in nine states across the country to lose access to abortion, and with another 11 states that have restricted access or are expected to by the absolutely outrageous overturning of Roe v. Wade by this radical extremist Republican controlled Supreme Court. Justice Thomas laid out a blueprint to take away more rights from the American people so that this threat to our rights is no longer hypothetical. Now, I am a woman of color who has had an abortion, who is in a loving interracial marriage and has an amazing trans daughter. This is a direct threat to me, my loved ones, and most importantly, to millions of people across this country who face one or more of these many threats that have been unveiled by the Dobbs decision and everything that could follow. These rights could begin to fall as soon as this October, which is why I introduced the Protecting Access to Contraception Act with Representative Mike Thompson and working tirelessly with my Democratic colleagues to protect all the other rights that are endangered by the Supreme Court's decision. Americans' constitutional right to privacy was examined for the first time in the 1965 case of Griswold v. Connecticut, which established the right to birth control and is the precedent upon which abortion and many LGBTQ rights have been based. The conservative opinion that overturned Roe has now suggested that somehow there were problems in the legal reasoning of that precedent. precedent. Ms. Warbelow, what happens when uh, the Supreme Court, a conservative Supreme Court, suddenly starts basing its jurisprudence on supposed perceived holes of uh, precedents that have been long established? 
It very much encourages state legislatures to try to pass laws to undermine and undo these precedents. This is not conjecture. This has already happened. We have seen states in the wake of Obergefell attempt to eliminate marriage for all couples um, as a right within their state. We have seen legislatures try to reaffirm their bans on same-sex couples marrying. And in the wake of the Dobbs decision, we saw a state in a filing to the 11th Circuit challenge the century-old century right to parental autonomy. These are not conjecture. These are real examples that are happening and will continue to happen. Thank you. Professor Murray, anti-abortion groups like Americans United for Life support revoking the right to in vitro fertilization and contraceptive measures like Plan B and IUDs to make sure that the American people are aware of this radical Republican agenda. Can you expand on how the conservative right is trying to take away the right to contraception and other reproductive care? Is that a question for me, Representative yes. Jay Paul? I'm sorry. Yes. Professor sorry, the internet is warbling a little. Um, yes, uh, the real question after Dobbs um, is what counts as an, abor an abortion? And the pro-life movement has for years sought to characterize certain forms of long-acting contraceptives as abortofacient. So Plan B, for example, intrauterine devices, which are increasingly common among women in the United States, all of these have been classed as abortifacients. And indeed, the Supreme Court has blessed them as abortifacients in Justice Alito's opinion in Burwell versus Hobby Lobby from 2014. So the real question is, what is an abortion? And they have said that these forms of contraception are in fact abortions. Thank you, Professor Murray. Let me just say that the inaction of the Senate because of the Jim Crow filibuster has left this giant vacuum where an extremist radical Republican controlled Supreme Court is set, not only have they overturned the precedent of uh, 50 years for women and pregnant people across this country to have control over our own lives, to keep people out of our bedrooms and our decisions, but now we are set to see a whole set of new rights taken away from Americans. That cannot proceed, and we must, must the make sure of, that- The time of the gentlelady has expired, Mr. Biggs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the Democrats have a radical view of abortion. Uh, for, former Virginia governor talking about third trimester, uh, Northam, Ralph Northam, talking about third trimester abortion said, I can tell you exactly what would happen. The infant would be delivered. The, the infant would be kept comfortable. The infant would be resuscitated if that's what the mother and the family desired. And then a discussion would ensue between the physicians and the mother. That's pretty extreme. Yesterday in the, in the oversight committee, a witness was asked uh, about infanticide. And the witness said, well, healthcare is a right. That's pretty radical. The U.S. is radical on abortion, led by the Democrats. The top, within the top 4% of most permissive abortion policies in the world. Same as China, no, China has no restrictions, North Korea has no restrictions, and Vietnam has no restrictions in law. But what about the EU? We keep hearing about the EU, and, and maybe we should follow their model. Well, here, let's go over what some of, their, some of those countries have. France only up to 14 weeks, Germany to 12 weeks, Greece 12, Hungary 12, Ireland 12, Italy 12, Latvia, Lithuania, and Luxembourg, all only up to 12 weeks. Malta, there is no abortion permissible. Spain, up to 14 weeks. Sweden, up to 18 weeks. The U.S. is pretty doggone uh, an outlier in the world, thanks to the leftist policies of the Democrat Party. So the, the, the Democrats have a real extreme radical view of abortion, and they use it and enforce it with fear. Here's one. New York Times op-ed tells the Democrats to embrace the politics of fear. When it comes to abortion rights, Democrats need to lean into the politics of fear. The party needs to scare voters and show that they, too, are scared, scared of the voters themselves. That's what Democrats are writing. Elizabeth Warren says to shut down all pregnancy center. She said, look, we need to shut them down here in Massachusetts, and we need to shut them down 
all around the country. So I know folks have been talking about, the, the, the ranking member talked about 50, but I get, one, I get one of these trackers every day. It's 57, 57 crisis pregnancy centers that have been attacked. And that doesn't even include the recent Bethesda church that was attacked last weekend. And according to my, a close friend of mine who lives in Portland, telling me about eight churches in the last few weeks that have been attacked. That doesn't include that. But that's the, that's the politics of fear. How about, how about the reported shutdown DC offering up to $250 just to track and cite and harass Justices Kavanaugh, Alito, Thomas Gorsuch, Amy Coney Barrett, and John Roberts. How about this one? Yesterday, yesterday, one of our own colleagues who sits on this committee, also sits in OGR, said, asking of a witness, quote, I'm worried about this. It was the founder of the Republican Party, President Lincoln, who said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. I believe this government cannot endure permanently half slave and half free. And then he asked, can we endure half free choice states and half theocratic compelled pregnancy states? Is that going to work for America? I don't know. Was he likening the abortion issue to slavery or was he likening it to creating an insurrection in the country. I don't know. That's wild. Ms. Foster, when I look at it, I see the radical, radical position of Democrats on abortion. And tomorrow the House will be voting on the Women's Health Protection Act of 2022. And supporters of the bill claim it will simply, simply codify Roe. But that isn't true. Can you explain what this bill actually does? That bill would strip away every protection for children in the womb. It would strip away protections for their mothers and, um, and also for health care providers. It would strip away conscience protections. It would strip away informed consent. It would strip away any gestational age limitations allowing for abortion up to the baby's birthday. It would, um, it would take away everything that we've built for 49 years since Roe. We would then become the most radical abortion nation in the world, more radical than China, North Korea, or Vietnam, which have no limitations. Is that fair to say? It is fair, yes. Democrats are radical and extreme on abortion. This bill is just another attempt by Democrats to expand abortion, override state laws enacted to protect the unborn. Life is the most precious thing we're given, and everyone, especially in the unborn, deserve that right. The time of the gentleman has expired, Ms. Scanlon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I do want to first challenge just one of the misleading talking points that our colleagues across the aisle and their witness have been pushing today, that the existence of pregnancy crisis care centers is somehow evidence that the anti-abortion movement actually cares about mothers and families. It's just not true. In fact, these crisis pregnancy centers are a well-funded arm of the anti-abortion movement that advances their agenda by using deceptive, and coercive tactics and medical disinformation to target low-income people facing unintended pregnancies to prevent them from accessing abortion and contraception. These crisis pregnancy centers, which actually outnumber abortion clinics, often misleadingly present themselves as providing medical services when they're not licensed to do so and therefore are not bound by the privacy laws that govern medical providers. And in fact, these anti-abortion facilities collect sensitive medical and personal information and then share it with anti-abortion organizations. These crisis pregnancy centers face limited public accountability despite the fact that they are increasingly siphoning off public funds from the TANF welfare programs, which are supposed to serve low-income women and families. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I seek unanimous consent to introduce a study by the Alliance of State Advocates for Women's Rights and Gender Equality entitled Design to Deceive, a study of the crisis pregnancy center industry in nine states, including Pennsylvania. Without objection. Thank you. Returning to the subject at hand, we're here in the wake of the deeply unpopular Supreme Court Dobbs decision to overturn Roe versus Wade, and with it, 50 years of settled law regarding the fundamental privacy right of women to make their own decisions regarding their own health care. I don't think we can underestimate the impact that the Dobbs decision will have upon the health and welfare of women in their families in this country, and upon the economic health and welfare of this country as a whole, by giving the green light to states to ban abortion, as many have rushed to do in the wake of this decision. And the suggestion that the decision has now been left to the people is 
fundamentally disingenuous given the fact that the Senate is blocking any such legislation with the filibuster. The Dobbs decision goes against the values of a strong majority of Americans that a woman should have the essential freedom to decide when and if to bear children and how many, and that politicians should not be in the business of mandating that women carry dangerous or unintended pregnancies to term. The vast majority of Americans understand that we don't need or want politicians invading our doctor's offices and that a woman's privacy, uh, invading our doctor's offices or a woman's privacy to impose an extremist minority view. When the reality is these decisions are complicated, they're complicated by the mental and financial health of a family, they're complicated by the physical health of both the woman and the fetus, they're complicated by whether or not the pregnancy was the result of abuse or criminal activity, and they're complicated by the fact that our society for decades has prioritized the well-being of unborn fetuses over that of children and families, and even the health of pregnant women. So unfortunately, the ramifications of this extremist decision do not end there. In overturning Roe versus Wade, the court has called into question a host of other privacy rights that Americans have relied on for more than half a century, including the right to obtain contraception, the right to interracial and same-sex marriage. Professor Murray, many of my constituents have questions about the ramifications of Justice Alito's decision and Justice Thomas's concurrence in Dobbs with respect to these fundamental privacy rights beyond a woman's freedom to make her own reproductive health care decisions. Can you help us explain in plain English why those opinions uh, raise alarms about other fundamental rights of self-determination? Happily, um, those opinions all proceed from the same grant of liberty in the 14th Amendment. Um, this grant of liberty, as I said before, comes from this Reconstruction era, the Reconstruction Amendment's commitment to an anti-slavery ethic, including providing the formerly enslaved with rights of bodily autonomy, control over their own reproduction, and of course, the ability to control their family lives. Um, when Roe was overturned and the right to privacy was casually dismissed by this conservative 6 to 3 supermajority, it unsettled all of these precedents. And the majority's efforts to confine its decision to just abortion is frankly gaslighting. Um, there is no way to confine that logic to just abortion. If Roe is egregiously wrong because it is not rooted in the traditions of this country and because it is not explicit in the text of the Constitution, all of these other rights are equally in, in peril. Um, all of them proceed from the same logic and they are all on the same path as Roe is. Thank you, and I yield back. General Lady yields back, uh, Mr. McClintock. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Foster, does the Dobbs decision ban abortions? It does not. Does it limit abortions? It does not. Does it say anything about abortions beyond that it simply can't find such a right in the Constitution? It does not. If a state chose to legalize unrestricted abortions on demand, is there anything in Dobbs that would prevent it from doing so? Um, clearly not. We've seen states doing that. I think the central question that, that both sides here are, are, are considering is, is whether Congress has the authority to adopt a federal law concerning abortion, either restricting it, banning it, or, or, or uh, allowing it. Is there anything in the Dobbs decision that would prevent Congress from doing so? Uh, no. The more difficult question that I'm struggling with is whether the Congress has the constitutional authority to ban or restrict or allow abortion, or if that is a matter that it leaves to the states through their elected representatives. What's your opinion? Yeah, um, you know, we at Americans United for Life take a, a both and perspective on that. We are looking for our, um, our elected representatives to lead. And to, um, and to take a strong position protecting life. We also expect our judges to um, follow the Constitution and protect all life in the Congress, law. Congress is given enumerated powers. I don't yes. find abortion one way or another among those enumerated powers. Is that not therefore left to the states to decide? It's certainly not an enumerated, an enumerated power. The, the, the majority of Americans tell pollsters that they support Roe v. Wade but at the same time, they also tell those pollsters that abortion should be banned after 15 weeks. Does Roe allow restrictions on abortions after 15 weeks? Uh, the current regime in our country, um, or prior to Dobbs, was that, um, was that in fact, uh, it was almost unrestricted abortion on so, demand. So, so Roe would prevent restrictions on abortions after 15 weeks? 
It, it had, yes. Yeah, okay. How about Dobbs? Does the Dobbs decision allow such restrictions? The Dobbs decision says that you can, in fact, um, protect women and children uh, after 15 weeks or before 15 weeks. Which is what a substantial majority of, of Americans, even though they say they oppose Roe, uh, actually support. Supermajority, yeah. yes. Um, I think laws have to be based on a broad consensus. Otherwise, they're ignored or they have to become oppressive. Um, and I do think there's a clear consensus that if somebody's lying unconscious in a, in a hospital bed and they have a heartbeat and a brainwave, they're a human being. You're not allowed to kill them. Wouldn't that same principle apply to the beginning of life, just logically? Um, you would think so, but some of your colleagues seem to disagree. Is, but isn't, and is also, that, that's what the Mississippi law says. Yes. Um, as I understand it, the, the concept of substantive due process rests with the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments' right to not be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Now, to my layman's eye, that, that seems pretty clear. You cannot be executed or jailed or fined without your day in court. Substantive due process uh, imagines a whole range of other rights that are not enshrined explicitly in constitutional or statutory law, but rather are established by judicial decree. Do I understand that correctly? You do, yes. Now, I happen to believe there's a class of rights that exist in nature. Th these are rights that are, uh, are not created by government. Rather, we create governments to protect these pre-existing rights. But to do so, we still have to define them. We do that through our Constitution and through our legislatures. Now, we just heard from one of the Democrats' witnesses that Defining such rights should not be left to the elected representatives of the people. So what's the alternative? Isn't it having unelected judges define these rights instead? Somebody has to define them. Do uh, I have that right? Apparently so, yeah. So which do you think is a safer repository of these rights, the people uh, or uh, appointed judges? I believe it's the people. Uh, it's the people who um, who have the rights and the people we elect our representatives to defend them. And, and shouldn't respect for democracy leave these issues to the people through their elected representatives? Isn't that what Justice Thomas is saying in his dissent? That's exactly what he's saying. The, the left tells us that any restriction on abortion forces a woman to carry a baby against their will. How do you respond to this? I believe, as I said a moment ago, that most women would choose to carry if we could improve their circumstances. That is exactly what this body should be doing. Thank you very much. I yield back. Gentleman yields back, Mrs. Swalwell. Thank you. Ms. Foster, you think a 10-year-old would choose to carry? Um, uh, in, in the 10-year-old case, first of all, the Ohio... You know, my, my question is, would a 10-year-old choose to carry a baby? In the Ohio case, the, uh, the Ohio you, Attorney would a, would a General said that choose, abortion no, no, would have been justified. Focus on the question, please. Would a 10-year-old choose to carry a baby? Um, I, I, I cannot. Do you think a 10-year-old should choose to carry a baby? I, I believe it would probably impact her, her life. And so, therefore, it would fall under any exception and would not be an abortion. Wait. It would not be an abortion if a 10-year-old with her parents made the decision not to have a baby that was the result of a rape? If a 10-year-old became pregnant as a result of rape and it was uh, threatening her life, then that's not an abortion. So it would not fall under any abortion restriction in our nation. Ms. Warbolo, um, are you familiar with disinformation? Uh, yes, I am. Did you just hear some disinformation? Uh, yes, I heard some very significant disinformation. Why don't you tell me about uh, that? Yes, an, an abortion is a procedure. It's a medical procedure um, that individuals undergo for a wide range of circumstances. Um, including uh, because they have been sexually assaulted, uh, raped in the case of the 10-year-old. Um, it doesn't matter whether or not um, there is a statutory exemption. It is still a medical procedure that is understood to be an abortion. Uh, beyond that, I think it's also important to note that there is no exception um, for the life or the health of the mother in the Ohio law. That's why that 10-year-old had to cross state lines in order to receive an abortion. Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Warbelow, uh, Ms. Warbelow. Mr. Chairman, yesterday, uh, Jim Jordan sent out a tweet that I'd like to put into the record with unanimous consent, um, and I'll read it in a moment. You read it, and then I'll give you that. It's, it's a Washington Examiner posting that Ohio AG Dave Yost said his office has not found any evidence of a 10-year-old rape victim in the state who, according to a report cited by President Joe Biden, 
was six weeks pregnant and traveled to Indiana to receive an abortion, Mr. Jordan's statement was, another lie, anyone surprised? Without objection. I'd also like to put into the record <coughs> from today's Wall Street Journal, from the editorial board, correcting the record on a rape case, and it's the journal correcting its own uh, misstatement the day before. Without objection. So yesterday, Ms. Warbelow, speaking of disinformation, Jim Jordan called a 10-year-old rape victim a liar. A 10-year-old rape victim was called a liar by the ranking member of this committee. And I know that he did that because he hates the president. It's clear every day from his statements and the statements from MAGA Republicans that they don't like Joe Biden, so they're gonna call him a liar. That's fine. But what is worse is the reason that he did it is because he doesn't like what that rape victim represents, which is that this law from the Supreme Court, Dobbs, and the laws that will follow in states like Ohio and Texas and Georgia and other states will bring us government-mandated pregnancies for 10-year-olds, fourth graders, little girls. And to deflect from that, they choose to bully and beat up transgender individuals who represent fewer than 1% of Americans. And they try and deflect that because they don't want anyone in America to realize that they don't just want to wage a war on women. They're now expanding it to a war on little girls. So, Ms. Warbelow, let's go back to where we started here. Can a little girl, should a little girl, make the decision to have a forced government pregnancy? Should she ever be put in that position? She should have the opportunity in consultation with her parents and her medical providers to make the decision that is in her best interest. And under this current law, does she have the opportunity to make that decision? She does not under Ohio law. Mr. Chairman, again, this is not about someone's ability to make a kitchen table decision with their family. It's about MAGA Republicans who want to control not just women, but little girls, and to put us into an era of government-mandated pregnancies without the opportunity to make that important kitchen table decision that will affect them for the rest of their life. And I yield back. Gentleman yields back, Mr. Stubbe. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the majority starts the hearing with the lie that there's a constitutional right to killing unborn children. There never has been that right. And nowhere in our founding documents or the Constitution does a constitutional right exist to murder an unborn child. In fact, the opposite is present, and Mr. McClintock touched on it, but I'm gonna elaborate. In the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendment to the Constitution, there is a constitutional right for any person to not be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, in two different amendments. Certainly, an unborn child is a person. I'm not sure what else it would be. Um, and I'm, I, I'm tested to see if the other side's going to ignore the science that the child in the womb is not a person. Therefore, that person shall not be deprived of life pursuant to our Constitution, and certainly not the opposite where they can be murdered. And there's been a lot of talk today about freedom. And there is no freedom to murder an innocent life, a person that was duly recognized under our Constitution. And the majority of the Supreme Court made this clear in stating, and I quote on page 25 of the opinion, its inescapable conclusion is that a right to abortion is not deeply rooted in the nation's history and traditions. On the contrary, an unbroken tradition of prohibiting abortion on pain of criminal punishment persisted from the earliest days of the common law until 1973. And then on page 69 of the opinion, they hold. We therefore hold that the Constitution does not confer a right to abortion. Roe and Casey must be overruled and the authority to regulate abortion must be returned to the people and their elected representatives. Since Roe v. Wade, over 63 million children have been slaughtered in an incorrectly decided decision. But finally, the issue has been returned to the elected representatives where it belongs, to right this wrong and give back the right to life guaranteed to every person in our Constitution. And we should be thankful today for the Supreme Court's decision in Dobbs and everyone who made it possible, and that includes our witness today, Mrs. Foster. And I wanna thank you for your commitment to life 
and the work that led to the decision in Dobbs. And I wanna personally thank you for your courage for being here. Uh, I wanna thank you, and, and, and I know it's tough up here, but know that hundreds of millions of Americans stand behind you, that we're praying for you, and that there is a large amount of support out there for you. And I had a list of questions for you, but a couple of questions ago, um, Mrs. Scanlon leveled a host of inaccurate disinformation about pregnancy centers, and so I would like to give you the remaining time that I have left if you would like to respond to any of that, or I can ask you the questions that I have for you, whichever direction you would like to go. Um, there's a lot I would like to respond to. You've got two um, minutes and 16 seconds to respond. Great, yeah. Uh, First Representative Scanlon um, seems to be almost talking about Planned Parenthood when she's talking about, about pregnancy centers. Uh, deceptive, well-funded, coercive, that defines Planned Parenthood and it defines big abortion. Um, and, and it seems to be to me that she's getting her information from the same place that um, that a previous representative did on her info about my organization because in fact we don't take a stance on contraception. Um, so that would be um, something that I would certainly um, recommend looking further into. Um, but then further than that, um, preteen pregnancies they are high risk and they fit the life exception. And so that isn't actually an abortion because the primary intent is to save the girl's life. An abortion is the intentional ending of a human life in the womb prior to birth, and that's not what would be going on there. Um, but I ask, really, how do we know about this little girl? Instead of re-victimizing her in front of the nation, here in Congress, on C-SPAN, why aren't we talking about the real issue here? Why aren't we talking about rape? Why aren't we talking about holding her rapist accountable? Instead, um, abortion and rape are both um, symptoms of the same violent ideology that says that we can violate others to achieve our own goals and fulfill our own desires. And I work alongside people who have experienced the most horrific um, sexual violence imaginable, and they understand that transcending these ills and overcoming them starts by refusing to perpetuate or to justify further violence. That is what this hearing should be about. We should be talking about that. We should be talking about helping women, giving women the resources that we need. Um, we need to be talking about how we can work together in a bipartisan way to help our nation's people, to help all Americans and make sure that we all have equal rights, equal human dignity, and instead we're just, you know, casting stones and, and, and throwing spears and trying to, and trying to, to intimidate the Supreme Court into, um, into regretting a decision that is completely constitutional and restores America's most fundamental human right to life. Thank you for being here today. I yield back. Gentleman yields back, Ms. Garcia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for bringing us together for this very important and very critical hearing. Uh, and I want to thank all the witnesses for being here today. Justice Thomas has de facto given the green light for the conservative-controlled states in our nation to continue a crusade against the liberties and freedoms of every individual that is not male, white, and straight. They started with women throwing us back to the dark ages, treating us as property and cattle, forcing us to give birth against our will, treating us as subjects and handmaids at the service of the government. Next, it will go against gays, lesbians, transgender individuals, and the LGBTQ community. In Texas, Republican Attorney General has already expressed no uncertain in no uncertain terms that he has a full intention of litigating in favor of overturning Lawrence v. Texas. Now, this case started in my district. Back then, it was uh, in 1988, the arrest of Mr. Lawrence was in a resident of what is now my district, and it was all about keeping the government's reach outside of people's bedrooms and their intimate life, lives where it should stay. It's regrettable that our Attorney General is already, already thinking about doing something about that. Republicans who claim to believe in small government in their never ending hypocrisy are weaponizing the state to criminalize the most intimate aspects of our lives. What happens between two consenting adults in the privacy of their homes is no one's business. Religion is not a basis for public policy. I am a Catholic, but we must keep our rosaries for prayer and not to restrain from their liberties. I thank the witnesses for coming and I want to start uh, with you, um, um, Professor Murray. Uh, 
Is it extreme that, that um, anti-abortion activists have been responsible for at least 11 murders, 26 attempted murders, 42 bombings, 194 arsons, and thousands of incidents of criminal activities directed at abortion providers since 1977? It is extreme. I find it really interesting that the Republicans in this hearing have emphasized the protests against the Supreme Court justices and individuals exercising their First Amendment rights in a peaceful manner, when in fact we have since 1977 a long history of actual violence against those who provide abortions and those who seek abortion care. I will also note that in 2014, the Supreme Court of the United States in McCullen versus Coakley invalidated a law that the people of Massachusetts enacted through their legislature to provide a 30 foot a 35 foot buffer zone between abortion clinics and protesters so that individuals could enter those clinics in a peaceful manner to make decisions about their health care. The Supreme Court invalidated that, subjecting those individuals to the protests and disagreements, and in often many cases, the intimidation of those who oppose abortion. So that's part of the hypocrisy. They don't want to buffer zone at the abortion providers' centers, but they want some type of buffer zone around their homes when they're eating. I mean, should we just put a, make them a little bubble boys and girls so they can just go and be protected in a bubble? I mean, the court emphasized that the protesters at abortion clinics were exercising their First Amendment rights in a peaceable manner. I do not condone violence in any way, but I agree with the court that those who wish to exercise their First Amendment rights peaceably should be able to do so. Well, I agree with you. I don't condone any violence, and I, in fact, am a former judge, and I, in fact, have had death threats. Uh, but, but I just feel that I've always had law enforcement. I've always had people who can protect you. Uh, and people have a right uh, to protest. They have a right to be there, particularly if they're staying in public public um, sidewalks. So thank you for that. And, and do you think that, that there's anything that, that would, you know, I keep hearing this whole notion of it needs to go back to the, the elected representatives. Well, last time I checked, I was an elected representative. That is exactly right, Representative Garcia. Um, I want to correct uh, Representative McClintock's statement that this does not augur uh, the prospect of a federal ban on abortion. Justice Kavanaugh, on pages two and three of his concurring opinion in Dobbs, makes clear that this simply returns this issue to the prospect of democratic deliberation in the states and Congress. That are the, those are the words of this opinion. This will surely come to Congress if there is a Republican majority. Thank you for your for that. And Mr. Chairman, I want to, for the record, introduce the National Abortion Federation Center's report dated May 19, 2022, listing all the violence against abortion providers since 1977. Without objection. Thank you. The gentlelady's time has expired. Mr. Tiffany. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Warbelow, did you have personal security to attend here today? I did not, but I do Great. have a security uh, thank, thank as Thank you for part that question, or thank you for that answer. Uh, Ms. Foster, um, we heard about targeting low-income, um, targeting low-income people. Could you give us just a brief tutorial on Margaret Sanger and Pla Planned Parenthood and their history? Uh, Margaret Sanger is one of the most noted eugenicists in um, our nation's history, if not the world's history. She believed in targeting um, minority populations, um, believed in, um, in, in targeting um, populations with disabilities, um, all kinds of, um, of just backwards, um, undemocratic thinking. Um, she also founded Planned Parenthood, which, you know, today does the lion's share, performs the lion's share of all abortions in America. And isn't it true that Nazi Germany actually invited her ilk to their country pre-World War II? They did. Yeah. Um, what, what effect would the, you talked earlier about the so-called Women's Health Protection Act of 2022 that failed in the United States Senate. Uh, could you comment on how uh, the impact on state governments that that bill would have? It would even go beyond Roe. Roe stripped away protections in all 50 states, um, even the states that had already moved to liberalize abortion law. Um, it stripped away protections in every single state, protections like um, informed consent, protections like, um, like 
if you name it, if it was on the books, it was gone. Um, this, this Women's Health Protection Act, which is incredibly deceptively named, they talk about disinformation. It's not about health or protection. It has nothing to do with the good of women. Um, that bill would strip away every protection that's been put on the books um, in American history would strip away the ability to see our own ultrasounds. If we ask to see our own ultrasounds, that could be denied us again. It would strip away informed consent, um, any kind of, of protection um, on late-term abortion, which of course, as we know, is far more dangerous uh, for the woman, um, high, much higher maternal mortality rate. It would strip away protections on chemical abortion, which is even more dangerous than a surgical abortion when it comes to hemorrhage and sepsis. You name it, it's on the chopping block. Um, so would it, would it remove parental consent? Yes. Okay, so we heard some rhetoric earlier about protecting little girls. Um, so in other words, um, me as parents, the, uh, my wife and I as parents, so in other words, if we had an underage daughter, that would remove us from the picture, is that correct? It sure would, yeah. Does it limit the health care information? Does this bill limit health care information that can be provided to pregnant women? Uh, the Women's Health Protection Act does. I, when, when we're talking about lack of informed consent, women don't even have the right to get the facts about the abortion, the procedure that they're about to undergo. Basically what you were saying earlier. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so um, I want to thank the chairman yesterday for clarifying the Democrat Party's position in regards to the Hyde Amendment. For those of you not familiar, the Hyde Amendment. You're welcome. The Hyde Amendment prevents uh, taxpayer dollars from being used um, for abortions. So in other words, you should pay for it. And if you have, let's say you have a conscience, let's say for conscience reasons, you say that um, you do not want to pay for an abortion, um, that would all go away. And um, uh, it's terribly unfortunate um, because we saw many Democrats over the previous decades that did have strong conscience provisions that believed in the Hyde Amendment, and our chairman now has made it very clear that the Democrat Party's position is that you shall pay for abortions if they're going to set the law here in our country. Um, I just want to close with this, and I want to address the young people that are here today. Thank you so much for joining us for this hearing. I want to talk to you about the history of the Republican Party. We were formed in 1854. We were the original single issue party, and that was to end slavery. And that was accomplished in our country. And we did it over the, well, we ended up fighting a war over it. And um, we are now here to protect life once again. It is now the Republican Party that stands for life in America. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman yields back, Mr. Uh, Ms. McBath. Thank you, Chairman. We have spent countless years listening to questions about women's personal freedoms from individuals with extreme views. Questions from individuals in this body who have already expressed by their actions and their rhetoric that the will of the American people should just simply be ignored. And after all the years of attacks on Roe v. Wade, after years of disingenuous questions and deceitful politics, I believe that it's time that those who have advocated for the overturning of a woman's right to choose answer some questions of their own. Does a 12-year-old girl, a middle schooler, who attends after-school programs because her parents work late, who is viciously raped on her walk home from school, should she have access to an abortion? Or must she be forced to carry that fetus to term for nine months, to wake up every morning to bouts of morning sickness, to shake in fear every time she is touched, the growing bump in her belly, a reminder each day of the unimaginable trauma she has suffered, memories she cannot escape, and a feeling she may never feel clean or whole again. Does a mother who has struggled to get pregnant, who has just gone in for a prenatal checkup and has been told the heartbreaking truth that her child will be stillborn upon delivery and that no matter what she does or no matter how hard she prays, her desire for motherhood will once again be denied. 
should her doctors be allowed to treat her miscarriage? Or must she be forced to carry her fetus to term, to grapple with the pain, the anguish, the devastation she feels being asked by passers-by in public how far along she is, or enduring comments on how beautiful she looks as an expectant mother, and how excited she must be for the arrival of her newborn child. Does a sophomore who plays varsity soccer and hopes to play in college one day, who's excited to go to prom in a few months and just had sex for the first time, who can't seem to understand why her shirts keep getting tighter. She finds herself with her head in the toilet one night, vomiting seemingly for no reason at all. And as her father comes to check on her, he startles her and she looks into his eyes, which are filled with tears. They both recognize that she is pregnant and that she, no more than a mere child herself, will be forced to give birth to one. Does she have the right to an abortion? Or will she be forced to feel the guilt and shame she believes she has caused her parents and her loved ones? For realizing that college may no longer be an option for her or that her future, her dreams, are deferred. In other words, I'd like to ask my Republican colleagues, do you support abortion in the first trimester? Do you support abortion in the case of rape or incest? Do you support abortion if it risks the life of the mother? Do you support abortion in the case of fetal abnormalities? Do you believe all abortion is murder? And if so, do you believe miscarriage is manslaughter? Do you believe women should face criminal penalties for seeking an abortion? Do you think doctors should be put in jail for providing them? Do you support a woman's right to make her own health care decisions? And the reason we will never hear a response to these simple questions is that they know the answers they give, Americans will find extreme and disturbing. They know that forcing women to have children without their consent is not a position that the American people find palatable. They know that forcing women to carry a dead fetus to term will not win them the support that they desire. Because what this decision takes from us, women, is our freedom, the freedom to choose our own destinies, the freedom to pursue the happiness that we envision for ourselves. There are legislators across America telling women that for nine months that they are mere subjects of the state that their bodies belong to the whims of an almighty government, that the liberty our creator endowed with us is no longer a self-evident truth, that the autonomy and independence God has given us has been stripped away by mere men. There is no freedom for a woman unless she has freedom over her own body. The time of the gentlelady has expired, Mr. Bishop. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Foster, is it, is it, does do laws against abortion prohibit removing a dead fetus from the woman? Absolutely not. That's my understanding as well. Um, I'd like to wanted to get that one out of the way because that continues to be re repeated uh, by the other side. Um, Professor Murray, you concluded your testimony, both your written version and the oral form, by saying that you quote call on this committee to protect these associated rights in a manner that is swift and absolute. That was your, your last word, absolute. And I understand, of course, these associated rights, you're speaking about several, but certainly the right to abortion. Do, do you mean by that that there should be no limits on it whatsoever, that it should be available until birth? What I meant in my written testimony, Representative, and many thanks for the question, is that fundamental rights should not be left to the democratic process. These are fundamental rights that each individual has and they should be protected as they were under the constitution. Do, do you mean that, that they're, they are absolute? I, my, my colleagues, when we were discussing the second amendment the other week, reminded me often that, second, that no constitutional right is absolute, a point with, that I readily concede. Do you, do you concede that there can be limits on the right to abortion? It is not a concession to say that there is no fundamental right that is unfettered. I teach that to my students every day in my constitutional law class. Um, the Second Amendment rights are not unfettered. They can be subject to government regulation, or at least they could until quite recently. All fundamental rights are subject to some limitations. But I ask for this committee to respond in a manner 
that was swift and absolute, I meant in terms of their commitment to protecting the rights of every person in the United States to enjoy these fundamental freedoms and not have their most intimate decisions made by the government. Do you support uh, the Women's Health Protection Act that is pending? That's what it's called by, the, by its sponsors. You've heard it referred to today, and I imagine you're familiar with it, that, it, that would allow uh, abortion until the moment of birth? Um, Representative, I think that's a mischaracterization of the Women's Health Protective Act. I'm supportive of any measure that this chamber takes to assure the rights of individuals to be free in this country and to enjoy the equality that is promised to us under the 14th Amendment to the Constitution. And I'm happy to elaborate if you'd like. Well, let me clear away then, the, if you said it's a mischaracterization of the bill, I don't think it is, but let me just ask you more uh, directly. Do you favor the Congress um, providing that abortion shall be protected until the moment of birth? I don't believe that abortion care allows for ab abortion until the moment of birth. That's not how this works. Individuals have the right to select an abortion. And when individuals do choose a late term abortion, it's usually because something tragic has happened in a pregnancy that was very much wanted. My point that this is a mischaracterization is that you are using inflammatory language to essentially damn those who choose to have a late-term abortion often because there are very few choices available to them because something tragic has happened in the course of a very much wanted pregnancy. That's my point. Should the rights of the unborn child uh, be weighed in the consideration of whether to allow a late-term term abortion? Well, I would respectfully note that in this court's decision in Planned Parenthood versus Casey in 1992, the court well, allowed I, the state I, to rather than wait. go back into the Constitution, I'm really just getting your advice because you're sorry, we're not the, talking about the Constitution. We no, can't no, go I'm, back. To I'm, the I'm interested in your in your advice to the committee about uh, that you concluded your uh, that you you urged the committee to protect these rights. And I'm asking not so much for a history of what the Supreme Court has said, but do you uh, do, do you contend that the child's rights, unborn child's rights, should be weighed in considering whether to limit late term abortion? As I was saying in Planned Parenthood versus Casey, the court allowed the states to regulate for the potentiality of life. That was the leavening of both do, the women's rights. Do, right do you believe it should be so limited? It doesn't matter what I believe. It all matters right. what the Constitution it, right. says and how the Constitution is interpreted. Thank you. Ms. Warbelow, the Human Rights Campaign also supports the Democrats' bill that I just made reference to. Uh, that it uh, for providing for abortion up until birth potentially isn't that correct? Uh, we support the bill, but again, uh, uh, like Professor Murray said, uh, your statements are a mischaracterization of what the bill does. You say that it could not protect the right to an abortion until the moment of birth. Is that what that isn't saying? how abortion care works, and in fact, to suggest that that's um, how abortion care works is really troubling and dangerous for women. Okay, so so only because you're saying that as a practical matter. That's not how abortions occur. Therefore, but the bill does allow, uh, it, by its terms, it allows that. Isn't that correct? It does not. Um, you know, it's a mischaracterization of how the bill operates. Um, as professor Time of the gentleman has expired, Mr. Stanton. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Nearly 50 years ago, the Supreme Court recognized the constitutional right to an abortion in Roe v. Wade. That ruling, anchored in our Constitution's right to privacy, was part of a litany of cases forming the doctrine of substantive due process, guaranteeing constitutional protections for many of the freedoms that we embrace and rely upon in the modern United States. Whether it be a parent's decision on how to raise their child, an adult's decision to marry the person they love, or the decision to use contraception, these private, intimate choices have long been left to the individual to make for themselves, not to politicians. In the weeks since Dobbs was published, I can tell you that the people of my district in Arizona are angry. They're angry because the Supreme Court's decision to overturn Roe reverses years of hard-won progress and precedent. It threatens the lives, careers, and families they've built and the plans they've made for their future. Simply put, it turns back the clock. While Justice Alito attempted to distinguish the right to an abortion from other personal freedoms recognized by the court in recent decades, like access to contraception, like marriage equality, his distinguishing rationale was so weak that there is little hope that other personal liberties 
will hold up to its scrutiny. Make no mistake, the Dobbs decision is a clear invitation to state legislatures to pass more hostile laws that, without a doubt, will result in litigation before the Supreme Court and will result in further fundamental rights being stripped away. You don't have to be a close observer of the court to know this. Today's Supreme Court majority will not stop at overturning the right to an abortion. Now, the court feels empowered and emboldened to ignore stare decisis and rewrite settled law. From Meyer, the case protecting parental decision-making, to Griswold, protecting access to contraception, to Loving, protecting interracial marriage, to Lawrence, protecting privacy for intimate relationships, to Obergefell, protecting marriage equality, a century of stare decisis is at stake. So now it's up to us, members of Congress, who are duty-bound to our voters, to take immediate action to secure our fundamental liberties through federal statute. That will require abolishing the filibuster, but protecting constitutional rights is more important than protecting our archaic rule of the Senate. Our Constitution, our country, and the American people demand it. I have a question for Mr. Obergefell. You're a legend. You've changed America for the better, so thank you for your leadership. I want to acknowledge that first and foremost, your courageous action. Do you trust Justice Alito's assurance that rights of LGBTQ plus people will not be overturned? And if so, why not? Not one bit. He clearly is opposed to marriage equality just based on his, his dissent in Obergefell. And regardless of what he puts in writing in this Dobbs decision, he, this decision opens the door to attack marriage equality. Justice Thomas's concurring opinion gives additional language and groundwork to do that. And to be fair, several of these justices during their confirmation hearings were not completely truthful, in my opinion, in their responses to their, their opinion on precedent relating to Roe versus Wade. So that piece of writing in that decision does not give me any comfort whatsoever. When one right is lost, all rights are at risk. Ms. Warblow, I have essentially the same question. Justice Alito's pronouncement in Dobbs that, quote, nothing in his opinion should be understood to cast doubt on precedents that do not concern abortion, unquote. Does that offer you any reassurance that this Supreme Court majority will not roll back protections or LGBTQ plus people? It's important to note um, that the majority opinion is a consensus document. It does not reflect what Justice Alito might have written had he chosen to write this decision alone. He and Justice Thomas have repeatedly said that they believe that the Obergefell decision was wrong. Not only did they say it in the dissent to that opinion, but they've said it subsequently, including in subsequent um, uh, court uh, uh, filings. Um, and so there is every reason to believe that they very much um, would invite and would like to see uh, that precedent overturned, along with other precedents, including Griswold and Lawrence. Thank you so much. The time we'll of the back. gentleman has expired. Uh, Mr. Roy. I thank the chairman. Uh, I've got a, a couple of questions here for Professor Murray. Uh, first, in terms of room raider, I appreciate the stuffed elephant in the background, uh, Professor Murray. Uh, as I'm looking at the backdrop there as a, as a dad, I'm enjoying that, that in the background. Um, I would ask you a question. Who, who decides when life begins? Well, thank you for the question, Representative Roy. It's nice to see you. I'll remind you that we overlapped at the University of Virginia many years ago. Yes, ma'am. Um, and I'm actually in my friend's son's bedroom. I'm on vacation with my family. <laughs> Um, the question of when life begins is an essentially personal question. It is often informed by the individual religious beliefs and moral sure. beliefs. Well, hold on. Yeah, I know, because I have limited. I'm sorry. Uh, you, know, you know I've got limited time. Well, hold on, Professor. Professor, I know I've got the limited time. Who, as a matter of law, as a, who decides when life begins and who decides when and how life is protected? The Constitution does not speak to the question of when life begins, just that it doesn't speak to many other things, including the right to an abortion and executive privilege so, and qualified immunity. So in it the, is a personal in, decision. In the absence, in the absence of, the, of the Constitution specifically saying when life begins, then who best to decide when to protect life, the people or courts? 
Representative Roy, as you know, the question of when life begins is a personal question informed by religious beliefs. Our constitution in the very first amendment says emphatically that the government shall not endorse any particular religion. It shall but not establish- But anything. professor, but professor when we have life, when we just make decisions about protecting life, which we do all the time, if, if a three month old infant is murdered, we protect that life. If a, four, if a 50 year old is murdered, we have laws across the country that protect that life. We make decisions about when life begins. My simple question is, as a matter of law, is when, who decides when we protect life and whether or not that is judges to decide that moment or whether that is elected representatives elected by the people? Well, Representative Roy, as you say, we have laws. Those laws are written by our representatives. We also have fundamental rights. And as you have noted, um, these fundamental rights are not unfettered, but they do allow individuals to possess certain freedoms. For example, the Second Amendment right, despite the fact that we have prohibitions on murder, allow individuals to bear arms. Indeed, sometimes to effects that are incredibly deleterious. So, to Professor, so let me ask, let me, Professor, let me ask you this question. Do you think Brown is settled law? Brown versus Board of Education. Brown is law. And you think then Plessy was not settled law and Brown righted it? I think that Plessy versus Ferguson espoused a doctrine of separate but equal that was absolutely antithetical to the principles of the right, equal but protection. You, but clause but, but the question here is, if you, do you agree when Justice Kagan in her confirmation proceedings, she said there were two ways to amend the Constitution, through Article 5 or through the judiciary, through the courts. Do you agree with that statement? That is typically how we have amended the Constitution in the past. So in other words, we so that it can in fact be amended through judicial action. As Justice Marshall said, do what you think is right and let the law catch up. But what I'm trying to get at here is when we're talking about judicial activism, we're talking about the court creating law, the court making the decision. The whole question here is who gets to decide? And I think that is what's fundamental. Let me ask you a quick question, Professor Murray, we're gonna run out of time. Do you think that the Heller decision, District of Columbia versus Heller is settled law? I think the Heller decision is one that was decided by it, this yes court. Or no, um, is it set, yes framework. or no, is it settled law? It is settled law, but it seems to have been expanded. And in is McDonald case. v. Chicago settled law? McDonald v. Chicago merely incorporates the reminders of the Second Amendment to the states through is, the 14th it, Amendment. Is it, the question is the questions here is simple, Professor. Are they settled law? Shelby County versus Holder settled law. Shelby County versus Holder simply uh, eliminates the preclearance formula. But, it, but yeah, I know what the case does. Professor, I know what the case does. Is it settled law? It is settled law. It thank you, thank you, thank you. And is Citizens United settled law? Citizens United provides that corporations have a First Amendment and right. I know, I know Professor, right I know you're a professor, and I know you can recite what's in the, in the cases. I'm asking if these are settled law. I think my well, point here, my, point, my point here is simple. Ma'am, ma ma I know. My point here is like simple. Professor, my point here is simple. The question here is who gets to decide? Who gets to decide these fundamental questions? And I the think- The time of the well, gentleman has expired. The time, time of the gentleman has expired, right. Ms. Dean. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to say to women and girls in our country, do not give up hope uh, because of the actions of a radical, extremist, corrupt Supreme Court. It is on all of us to be sure Dobbs is not our future, a future where women and girls are reduced to second-class citizenship, a future where my daughters-in-law and my granddaughters have fewer rights than I had. Uh, I wanted to talk to you, Ms. Warbelow and Professor Murray, about language. Language matters. And I don't know if you're paying attention, but I have a feeling you are, to the veiled and sometimes not so veiled language of incredible disrespect for women and girls that we've heard thrown around here and we hear thrown around. Representative Gohmert, speaking of Planned Parenthood, said something, I'll paraphrase, get a younger girl started on birth control to better the odds that she'll forget to take the pills so she'll get pregnant and have an abortion. Representative Gates, talking about snap abortions. Obviously, someone who's never been pregnant, there's nothing snap about an abortion. The witness, our expert here, fabricating that if a woman, woman had a procedure uh, to save her life, or a girl had a procedure to save her life, it is no longer an abortion. Of course it is, it's a medical procedure. 
Republicans think women are too stupid to make decisions for ourselves. Can you briefly both comment on this? And not shockingly, this language is all coming from white men, white men of privilege and power. Can you speak to the language issue? Language always matters. How um, our nation's elected officials speak about women, about LGBTQ people, about people of color has real ramifications. We know that it increases um, feelings of depression and isolation, particularly among youth. To be suggested um, that uh, they are less than fully human, less than fully wanted. And so the rhetoric that comes from our elected officials has real implications. Thank you. I would encourage everyone to be thoughtful in how they speak about Thank folks. You. Thank you for that. Professor Murray, could you say just briefly any observations you have on the language of disrespect toward women and girls? I think the entire job's opinion is about the language of disrespect to women and girls. Um, Planned Parenthood versus Casey made very clear that these rights are essential to women's equal citizenship. The court did not even entertain the prospect of women's equality to say other than that they found that it was inconsistent with its precedents. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Obergefell, I am thrilled to meet you today. I hope next time it will be in person. I thank you for being here. I thank you for being uh, the face of courage uh, and the face of change, the face of expanding rights in this country, not the shrinking of them. Your description in your testimony of your marriage, of your 20 years together, of your love, of your dreams, of your disagreements, sounds a lot like my marriage. Your description of your care for your husband uh, as he suffered and struggled with ALS down to his last day. As you say, if that isn't a marriage, I don't know what is. Again, reminding me of the power of marriage. I had the honor this summer to marry two of my friends in a same-sex marriage. Uh, and I use the words, and I wonder if you love these words as much as I, Massachusetts Supreme Court Justice Margaret Marshall in 2003 becoming the first state to recognize uh, same-sex marriage, and I'm abbreviating what she said so eloquently, I commend it to everyone. Quote, marriage is a vital social institution because it fulfills yearnings for security, safe haven, and connection that express our common humanity. Civil marriage is an esteemed institution, and the decision whether and whom to marry is among life's most momentous acts of self-definition. Do you agree with that description of marriage, same sex or other? Uh, and can you speak to your feelings when you read the Clarence Thomas clarion call when he says the court to today declines to disturb substance due process in cases like Gebert Appelled? For that reason, in future cases, we should consider all of this court's substantive, including Obergefell. How did you feel? Well, thank you, Representative Dean. When I read those words in Thomas's opinion, they angered me, they upset me, because here was a justice on our nation's highest court whose marriage exists because of a Supreme Court decision taking aim at our marriage to say he still believes we are less than, we are less worthy than, our relationships, our families do not matter as the Time of the gentlelady has expired, Mr. Thank Fitzgerald. You. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I think one of the things we're hearing today is the complete disdain by members of Congress um, for the Tenth Amendment and the ability for the states to actually govern themselves. Or the idea that um, legislatures that are elected by people in South Dakota versus California or New York versus Wisconsin can actually have diverse opinions on something as controversial as abortion. Um, it, so there's a patchwork that exists because there's been many states that have been working on pro-life legislation at the state level for literally since Roe versus Wade was put in place. Um, and, and Wisconsin, my state, falls into that category. So, and I was in the state senate for 27 years, worked on a number of different uh, pro-life pieces of legislation, and including constitutional amendments to pro prohibit partial birth abortion. Uh, it, and as we continue to pass those bills, it was all done under the guise of uh, we were walking the fine line right up to Roe versus, Roe versus Wade. 
So uh, when I was majority leader in 2015, we passed a law prohibiting abortions after 20 weeks. Uh, Wisconsin also has a law in the books passed before Roe versus Wade that bans abortion in all cases except for the life of the mo mother, subject to penalties under a different felony case than the 2015 law. Uh, it's my understanding it's common for criminal statutes to overlap, and the old law should in no way conflict with the 2015 law, which also provides for civil claims for damages, uh, for example, against any person who performs an abortion on a pregnant woman in violation of the act. Uh, the only difference between the two statutes is one was written before Ro Roe versus Wade, one was written after. Um, the Supreme Court decision in the recent Dobbs case is binding on the states and any Wisconsin statute that had conflicted with Roe should now have full legal force and effect. However, I think what we're seeing is that Democrats who don't trust their legislatures or governors are trying to circumvent the law. They're trying to figure out a way of let's work around the local people, local yokels in the state legislature because we know better in Congress. We always know better which is always puzzling to me because there's such a high percentage of members of Congress that served in the state legislatures. Uh, in Wisconsin, our governor, Governor Evers, promised to provide clemency to any physician that is charged under Wisconsin abortion laws. Our attorney general brought a suit against the state legislature already, which is legally questionable in its own right, asserting that the 2015 law supplants the earlier Wisconsin law because they are, quote, in direct conflict with each other. Uh, I believe the only, uh, the only difference between the two statutes is that one was written after Roe and one before, again. Um, so my question would be uh, to Ms. Glenn Foster, what has been kind of the recent response and the knee jerk that you're seeing kind of from state to state as we look at um, this distrust for the state legislatures and, and what they may do or not do in light of the ruling? You know, most states are moving to protect human life. They're moving to um, to put those those pre-row laws or those post-row laws into enforcement. Um, that 2015 law it was a temporary solution to the row problem and it did not repeal Wisconsin's pre-row law. So that pre-row law sets the abortion policy of Wisconsin, which is a state that I love, um, I'm a Pack Packers fan, Bucks fan, um, you know, love the cheese state. Um, but Wisconsin is also a pro-life state and, um, and it is, you know, it's going to be free from abortion businesses. Do you think that um, as this um, quote unquote patchwork exists, that it will be an opportunity for the electorate to kind of revisit some of these issues and adjust uh, compared to what the Supreme Court has done? It is, yes. That's why we have elected representatives and the, the American people are going to make their will known. We've seen that in the polling. We know that the American people support life and we expect to see that the American people and their elected representatives will pass laws that will protect life going forward. Very good. Thank you, and I yield back. The gentleman yields back, Ms. Escobar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and many thanks to our witnesses. Today's hearing is an opportunity for us to examine the kind of future that Republicans, including those on the Supreme Court, have shown that they want for us in America. In a nutshell, their future uh, the future that they are working on is rights for me, but not for thee. It's about turning back the clock so that our country allows Republican-controlled states to create second-class citizenship for certain groups. I'd like to share a brief story. A constituent of mine, a mother who I admire tremendously, recently told me about her abortion. She and her husband had two children when they learned about a new pregnancy. They were so excited about the news. They bought a crib. They were planning for their new baby. They looked forward to this future. In her final trimester, her doctor gave her the tragic news that her baby was not viable. And if she carried the baby to term, she would most certainly die, leaving her, her two children motherless. She had to make the difficult decision to terminate her pregnancy. She went to a clinic, and in addition to the devastation and sadness that she felt, 
She had to endure the chiding of protesters who were shouting at her as she walked in. People who thought they should have the last word over the decision she and her doctor made. People who thought they knew better. In the Republican Party's view, and indeed in the laws they have written in states today, this mother would not have been able to terminate this pregnancy. She would have died, and the baby would not have survived outside the womb. Her two children would be motherless, and her husband would be a widower. So when one of my colleagues claims that, quote, all life is precious, there really should be an asterisk by his statement, because there are many exceptions to that statement for them. One of them being women, because apparently women are expendable. This is the Republican Party's vision for women and families and children in America, where women and even a 10-year-old impregnated by rape will be forced to move forward with government-mandated birth, even as in the case of my constituent, when she faced certain death. The Republican witness said we should have a hearing on helping American families. Ms. Foster, Democrats have indeed had hearings on helping American families. And House Democrats passed a bill that would provide parents with paid family and medical leave so that they could be home with their newborn baby. We passed a bill with access to childcare so that those parents could go to work and provide for their babies. And universal pre-K, for children so that those babies could get a good start on their education. And every Republican voted against that. We also had hearings and passed bills to help keep children alive, to have the freedom to live free from the carnage that comes with gun violence. Every Republican here voted against that as well. Make no mistake about it, while Republicans may be pro-forced birth, they are anything but pro-life. In Republican-controlled states with the harshest abortion laws, like my own state of Texas, we have underfunded schools, failing foster care systems, lack of access to health care. I could go on and on and on. This is what they call being pro-life. What else is in the future that Americans are plan that Republicans are planning for Americans? Justice Thomas, in his opinion, has literally invited states to challenge marriage equality, access to birth control, and more is sure to come. So for Americans listening at home, you think you have a right for birth control? If you do, think again, you're on their list. You think you have a right to marry who you love? If you do, think again, you're on their list. As Republicans continue to try to strip women and children of their rights, creating a whole class of second-class citizens, my Democratic colleagues and I will continue to fight for you. We trust you. We believe in you. We believe in your right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Thank Mr. You. Chairman, I yield back. Gentlelady yields back. Mr. Owens. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the eloquent defense of life offered by many of my Republican colleagues this morning. I add my voice to theirs in recognizing the sanctity of all life. Having grown up in the Jim Crow South of segregation and KKK, I'm familiar with the true racism, intolerance, and hate, all due to the color of my skin. I see the same thing today in 2022 as the hard left, the so-called party of tolerance, who bang the drum of racism, inequality, inequity, do not practice what they preach. The leaked opinion and reversal of Roe versus Wave unleashed carefully planned attacks on pro-life organizations, violent protests, and assassination attempt at the home of Supreme Court Justice and his family, and racially charged Firestone against Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas. That's nothing new for Justice Thomas, who has been the target of the elitist left for 40 years. Instead of celebrating the second black American in our nation's history, highest court. They declared open season with vicious and racist attacks. This is because he's an articulate, confident black American who loves the American cult tenets of God, country, and family. It's because he's a black man who dares to think differently than they would love for him to, 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 to think. I'd like to share some comments of their comments with this committee. 
Samuel L. Jackson called Justice Thomas Uncle Clarence and tweeted the ban that a ban on interracial marriage is next. Representative Benny Thompson called Justice Thomas Uncle Tom, citing his support for voter ID in opposition to affirmative action. He stated that Justice Thomas doesn't like black people. He doesn't like being black. I'm gonna take a second and repeat that line. Justice Thomas doesn't like black people. He doesn't like being black. Chicago Mayor Lightfoot attacked Justice Thomas in a profane rant, suggesting the decision would lead to overturning gay marriage. Hillary Clinton called Justice Thomas an angry person of grievance. It's not just Justice Thomas the attack. CNN suggested that Congresswoman Myra Flores wasn't the real deal. They believe, and I quote, she, she holds views outside Latino mainstream. Myra too dares to think differently than what the elitist left demands. A guest on MSNBC, Joe, host uh, Joy Reid, called Virginia Lieutenant Governor w w Winsome Sears a black mouth of white supremacy. Twitter allowed Uncle Tim to trend for hours after Senator Tim Scott, State of the Union, rebuttal before taking action. A white newspaper uh, cartoonist for the Utah State uh, Salt Lake City Tribune portrayed me as a white Klansman so typical of the condescending racism. If these attacks, same attacks were aimed at Barack Obama, it will be called out by this committee and the media for exactly what it is, pure racism. This chairman would probably hold a hearing on it. I'd like to tender some advice for those on the left to attempt to divide us with their hateful rhetoric. First, I recommend a good book that I read a couple decades ago called How to Win Friends and Influence People. The hard left is failing big time in this area. The second, I suggest, you, I suggest you've totally missed the basic one-on-one -on -one of the American spirit. We don't respond well to intimidation and bullies and cowards. This pattern of intolerance is disgusting, unjustified, un-American. Most importantly, it shows how far we've come from MLK's dream, where our children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the character of their content. Instead of working to delegitimize our institutions, default into fear-mongering tactics and basic arguments that the Supreme Court wants to take away our rights, we should be honest with the American people. Dishonesty is not appreciated by the American people, and you'll see that in November of this year. Check it out. Roe versus Wade costs us 23 million innocent lives, like the post, like the pro, uh, uh, like the pro-slavery Democrat Dred Scott decision in 1857. It was a flawed decision. Overcoming Roe didn't outlaw abortion or take away the constitutional right of Americans. It put the decision in the, in the state hands, in the hands of we the people where it belongs. To the angry left, it's time to settle down, take off your masks and show your cowardly faces, put down your stones and firearms, and through, and through civil debate, convince us that you're right. My prediction is you have no clue. In the meanwhile, black constitutionalists on the, a black constitutionalist on the Supreme Court who stands with that decision should be revered, not ridiculed. Last thought, Justice Thomas is old school. I promise you will not be intimidated. Thank you, and I'll be back. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the, uh, the, for what purpose does Ms. Jackson Lee seek recognition? Very quickly, Mr. Chairman, I have unanimous consent to submit into the record the uh, uh, senatorial testimony of the Supreme Court judges of Kavanaugh, uh, Gorsuch, and Amy, Amy Barrett. Texas woman, 26, charged with murder over self-induced abortion. Uh, Texas abortion law strains clinics, according to doctors. Uh, attacks about against abortion providers by anti-abortion activists. And finally, doctors' worst fears about the Texas abortion law coming true. I ask unanimous consent to submit all of these into the record. Without objection. Thank you. Uh, the chair now recognizes himself for five minutes. I want to start by thanking Chairman Nadler for holding this urgently needed hearing today. And I offer my thanks to all of the witnesses for their thoughtfulness and for their time. As I read through Justice Thomas's concurring opinion in Dobbs, I think of the heads up he gave us about the far right majority's plan to overturn other well-established constitutional rights that Americans had just taken for granted in their daily lives. In particular, Justice Thomas calls on the court to quote, reconsider all of this court's substantive due process precedents, including the court's 1965 decision in Griswold, as well as the court's decisions in Lawrence v. Texas and 
Obergefell. These are, of course, the three cases establishing the constitutional rights to contraception, non-procreative intimacy, and marriage equality. In casting doubt on these decisions, Justice Thomas let us know that the far-right majority on the court is not satisfied to have deprived millions of Americans of the right to an abortion. Rather, the majority is on a rampage against other freedoms currently enjoyed by the American people. As someone who has repeatedly drawn attention to the partisanship of the far-right majority on the court and the fact that these six justices are not people who can simply be reasoned with using sound legal arguments or even the court's own precedents, I can't help but think of Justice Thomas's glaring omission of another case, and this has been discussed to some extent today. That case is a 1967 decision called Loving v. Virginia, which established the constitutional right to interracial marriage. It seems to me that following Justice Thomas's logic about reconsidering the court's substantive due process precedents, the Loving decision would fall naturally on his list. In fact, the Supreme Court's 1973 decision in Roe v. Wade explicitly relied on the decision in Loving v. Virginia. Moreover, the case is cited multiple times in both Justice Alito's majority opinion and in the dissent in Dobbs. Now, my Republican colleagues would say that Justice Thomas's omission of Loving v. Virginia is nothing at all to do with the fact that he's a black man married to a white woman. Never mind that he tried to block the January 6th committee from seeing documents that may have included evidence of his wife plotting the insurrection at the Capitol. He would never do something that is in his personal interest above that of what the law requires or sound legal reasoning requires. Uh, Professor Murray, what does it say to the reputation of the Supreme Court, or what, rather, what does it do to the reputation of the Supreme Court and to people's faith in the institution? that justices like Clarence Thomas appear to be deciding cases based on their own personal preferences and political ideology rather than what the law requires. Thank you, Representative Jones. Um, I will note that this idea that judges deciding cases based on their own predilections um, is the very essence of the judicial activism that your conservative colleagues have denounced. I also wanted to respond to Representative um, Owens's comments about condescending racism. Um, I would like to perhaps call attention to the condescending sexism of this decision, which seems to view the choices of women as somehow illegitimate when they make them. Um, the Supreme Court has virtually ignored American women with decision, this decision and the consequences will be startling and alarming. Thank you, Professor. A Gallup poll released on the day before the Dobbs decision revealed that 75% of Americans do not view the court as a legitimate, nonpartisan institution. Confidence in the court is vanishingly low for good reason. The question is, what the hell is Congress going to do about it? And it turns out we are not powerless to stop this court's rampage against our freedoms. Congress, in fact, has a breathtaking number of options to rein in the power of this rogue Supreme Court. In the past, Congress has deprived the court of appellate jurisdiction to issue certain decisions. It has expanded and contracted the number of justices. It has granted and withheld the court's power to issue injunctions and other writs. It has immunized particular types of defendants and executive actions from judicial review. It has suspended causes of action to bring certain challenges. And of course, it has taken other actions. I have routinely urged this body to take action to reform the Supreme Court action that is desperately needed to meet this moment in our history. It's why I introduced, along with Chairman Johnson and, and Chairman Nadler, the Judiciary Act to add four seats to the Supreme Court of the United States. And additionally, I recently proposed an amendment to the Women's Health Protection Act that would strip the Supreme Court of its jurisdiction to review that very legislation and channel all review of its constitutionality and legality to the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals. Interestingly enough, the conservatives on the court, specifically Justice Roberts and Justice Thomas, have long endorsed Congress's ability to do these things. We are at an inflection point, and years from now, history record, will record this as the moment when we decided what we would do to defeat the threat of fascism in this country posed by the modern-day Republican Party with the Supreme Court of the United States as an accomplice. I yield back. And the chair now recognizes Mr. Benz. Mr. Chair, and I yield my time to the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Johnson. Uh, thank you so much. Thank the gentleman uh, for yielding. You know, I'm going to bring this home. I think I'm the last one on the Republican side. Oh, and we have Mr. Raskin. Boy, I don't want to upstage him. But let me say, there's been a lot of alarmist rhetoric here today. There really has. 
And um, I'm just asking, Ms. Warbelow, because something you said earlier really struck me. You, you lamented our dusty old founding documents and you, you expressed your obvious disdain for the founders who drafted them. That's how it was received here. I'm not sure if that's what you intended, but are you aware, or, or let me say, would you agree that America is indeed the most successful, most powerful, most free nation in the history of the world? I would uh, agree that America is a critically important country, one that I love, but it has made mistakes and it continues to make mistakes. And as Americans, we need to come together to correct those mistakes. And I apologize if what you took away um, was a critique um, of our founders. My critique is that the founders were not representative of the people of the United States sure. well, let me, crafting let me, our let documents. Let me reclaim my time. So, but they did acknowledge that we are in the process of making a more perfect union. And the idea that we're not the most exceptional nation in the world, I don't think is backed up by objective evidence. But, but let me just say that the great nation, I would, I would assume you would, you would agree that it is, we are at least a great nation, a very important nation. I won't paraphrase what you said, but we are, and there's a reason for that, right? And it's not by happenstance. It's because we were founded, as my dear friend and colleague Burgess Owens just noted, on the bold declaration that all men are created equal and in the image of our creator. And because of that, we believe that every single human life has inestimable dignity and value. And by the way, your value is not related in any way to the color of your skin or what neighborhood you grew up in or where you went to school. Your value is inherent because as the founders noted, it is given to you uh, by God. And we believe every person should then be measured by the content of our character, as Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said. And we also believe, and I think America was founded upon this premise, that a just government protects innocent life. It honors marriage and family as the primary institutions of a healthy society and it embraces the cultural influences of religion and morality. And, and we believe and we propose, and I, it should not be a controversial notion because it wasn't in previous generations, that, that we preserve these ideals, we maintain these, as Ms. Foster articulated earlier. We, when we do that, we maintain the goodness of America, which really has been the secret of our genius and greatness. I've got two minutes and 20 seconds left. I'd yield to Ms. Foster. Is there anything you want to add as we uh, wrap this up today? I would. Um, you know, Justice Thomas, he is, um, he's a philosopher, he's a textualist, we know that. And so he is not seeking to, to strip away rights, he is simply seeking to more firmly ground them in our nation's constitution. Um, and by doing that, they will be um, more secure, really, even than before. We know that from, um, from Obergefell, which had both um, equal protection and substantive due process woven throughout that decision. We know that from the Loving decision, um, which was um, founded even more strongly on equal protection than substantive due process. We know that from all of the lines of decisions that we've talked about here today. And we also know that substantive due process has a bit of a checkered past. It did not protect workers in Lochner. It did not protect um, black Americans who were enslaved in Dred Scott. And so we really were looking to um, to redeem the foundation of our nation and to um, and to redeem these rights and make sure that they are grounded properly in our nation's constitution so that they can be um, protected for all time to come. And, and on that process in making a more perfect union, look, I'll just note, uh, because this is the last anyone on our side will be able to say, we just celebrated our 246th birthday as a nation on July 4th. And we're still an experiment in, in, in self-governance. We're an experiment on the world stage. We have the greatest constitution ever written. It's, it's endured for this long, but it won't endure if we abandon its principles and untie ourselves from the moorings. That's what textualism, originalism is all about. We, we, we want to defend this matchless constitution. It's the model for everybody else around the world. And there's a reason, these are real reasons that we are the greatest nation yet. And by God's grace, grace will continue to be. Um, I, there's been a lot said here today at the end. I hope that's what comes through, that we want to defend those fundamental freedoms. And again, as it said in the very birth certificate of the nation, 246 years ago in a few days, that that begins with the recognition you have an unalienable right to be born. With that, I yield back. The gentleman yields. The chair now recognizes a gentlelady from North Carolina, Ms. Ross, for five minutes. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair, and I want to thank all of our witnesses and panelists for joining us today and the many people who came here in person to hear such important testimony about such important issues. The Supreme Court's decision in Dobbs versus Jackson's Women's Health 
threatens some of our most fundamental American freedoms. This decision sets the groundwork for the court to overturn past decisions concerning people's right to privacy far beyond abortion, as we've heard, including the right to obtain contraceptives, the right to marry a person of a different race, the right to decide how to raise our own children, the right to protect, protection from the government for interference in our intimate lives, and the right to marry the person we love, regardless of their sex. The vast majority of Americans support these rights. And it is deeply concerning that this court has acted against the will of the people to roll back freedoms, to roll back freedoms that so many of us have come to enjoy as we've grown up and we have taken them for granted. Overturning the right to contraception in particular could be even more damaging to women and families than the reversal of Roe versus Wade. It would lead to far more unintended pregnancies and therefore more abortions. If Griswold versus Connecticut were overturned as a result of Dobbs, married couples and others could be barred from making their own decisions about whether or not to have a child. We do not and should not look to the Supreme Court for advice on when and how to raise a family. But this court has inserted itself into the lives of millions of Americans nonetheless. Both those in favor and opposed to abortion rights overwhelmingly support the right to contraception. When I advocated for women's rights in North Carolina, I found unity on both sides of the political aisle working to expand access to contraception. I got bipartisan sponsors to support legislation requiring insurance to cover contraception even before the Affordable Care Act. Our lead sponsor, a Republican doctor. A poll by 538 last month found that over 91% of Americans believe contraception, like condoms and birth control pills, should be legal. And in fact, slightly more Republicans were in favor than Democrats in that poll. Similarly, the vast majority of Americans, 71%, support marriage equality. This court, which Senator McConnell manipulated to create conservative, a conservative activist majority, has corroded the very fabric of freedom in the United States, putting many of our most popular and fundamental rights in jeopardy. My first question is for Professor Murray. Justice Thomas, in his concurring opinion, took aim at these landmark cases. But what effect would removing the right to contraception have on women, men, and families in our country? It would be absolutely devastating, Representative Ross. Um, the right to contraception allows individuals to make decisions about the planning and timing of their families. It allows them to finish their educations, to pursue employment opportunities. Women have depended on this and have organized their lives around the availability of this right in the same way that they organized their lives around the availability of the right to an abortion. And so it would be absolutely devastating. And as a follow-up to that, what effect would it have on public health, on sexually transmitted diseases if condoms were outlawed? All forms of contraception, the unavailability of them would have profound effects for public health. And we are already seeing some anecdotal evidence around the country of certain forms of um, healthcare being denied to individuals on the ground that they may also cause abortions or miscarriages. You could have the same kind of effects in terms of sexually transmitted diseases if condoms were not available, um, if certain forms of birth control weren't available because they have other indications and other uses um, for which they might be prohibited. So again, this would be absolutely devastating on a number of fronts. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and I yield back. The gentlelady yields. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Maryland, Mr. Raskin, for five minutes. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Um, when this hearing began, the gentleman from Ohio rattled off a list of uh, incidents of vandalism and graffiti and break-ins at churches taking place, and he mentioned 
uh, several of them in my district. And I want to say that I denounce and I categorically reject uh, these outrageous acts of vandalism and graffiti uh, and break-ins against churches in my district, regardless of who did them, left, right, or center, this must end, and this is not a proper way for anyone to treat other people's property or churches or to express political opposition. Now, does the gentleman from Ohio and to his colleagues on that side of the aisle reject the acts of the, the already proven acts of murder and violence that have been taking place against doctors, nurses, police officers, and healthcare providers, not over the last several weeks or months, but over the last several decades. Do they denounce, did they denounce the murder of OBGYN Dr. David Gunn of Pensacola, Florida, who had been the subject of wanted posters by Operation Rescue? Do my colleagues denounce, did they denounce the murder of Dr. John Britton a physician and James Barrett, a clinic escort, also shot to death in Pensacola, Florida. Do they denounce the murder of Shannon Lowy and Leanne Nichols killed in clinic attacks in Brookline, Massachusetts? How about Robert Sanderson, an off-duty police officer who worked as a security guard in an abortion clinic in Birmingham, Alabama, who was killed when his workplace was bombed, and so on. I could go on all day, I just have a couple of minutes. Murders, assaults, kidnapping. Where do they stand on all of these? Hundreds and hundreds of acts of violence against abortion clinics, or do they just oppose uh, incidents that take place? Uh, we don't know who, by who, for example, in my district yet, um, but presumably uh, they think by people on the other side. I denounce it all. Do they denounce it all? I, I hope that they would. Now. Um, I was hoping my friend from Louisiana would still be here. Uh, I, I'm glad, uh, I know he had to go vote. Uh, I wonder if my colleagues know, uh, I, I know that my colleague from Louisiana, the erudite Mr. Johnson, would certainly know this, that five of the justices, a majority of the court, five of the justices in the Roe versus Wade majority were appointed by Republican presidents. What if they know that? Justice Blackmun, who was named to the court, nominated to the court by Richard Nixon. Chief Justice Berger, Nixon. Justice Powell from Virginia, of course, he was a Nixon appointee. Potter Stewart, Eisenhower, William Brennan, Eisenhower. There were two others in the uh, majority who were Democratic appointees. LBJ had appointed Justice Marshall. FDR had appointed uh, Justice Douglas, who was still on the court at that point. And uh, of the two dissenters, one was a Democratic appointee, Byron White, and one was a Republican appointee. And in fact, um, that was basic constitutional doctrine for more than a half century, and Republican appointees kept reaffirming it, including Justice Stevens, uh, the Ford appointee, and Justice Souter, who was a very strong champion of Roe versus Wade and the constitutional right to privacy. But what happened was a transformation within the Republican Party because they began to insist that opposition to Roe versus Wade be a litmus test issue, the central issue that judges would have to pass or lawyers would have to pass before they got appointed to the bench. And so it became a decades long campaign to overthrow Roe versus Wade, which had been principally the handiwork of Republican appointees to the court, but it had built this wonderful line of precedent about the constitutional right to privacy. And they were so emphatic about it that in 2006, they blocked President Obama's nominee, Merrick Garland, from even getting a hearing. The chief judge of the DC Circuit Court of Appeals did not even get a hearing because they said it was too close to the election, a year before the election. Then what happened four years later with Amy Coney Barrett? They rammed through her nomination in the last several weeks of the Trump administration, when voting had already begun across the country in early voting, in their uh, madcap determination to create this anti-Roe majority. That's why we are where we are. And you know what I say? Okay, they played politics that way. I hope that every Republican in the country who's pro-choice decides to abandon their dangerous extremist party and come over to a party that stands up for the freedom of the people. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, the chair now recognizes the gentlelady from Missouri, Ms.
Bush for five minutes. Thank you, uh, St. Louis, and I thank you, Chairman. Um, so just a few weeks ago on Juneteenth, I introduced into the congressional record a document to commemorate the unveiling of the Freedom Suits Memorial Monument. The Freedom Suits Memorial paid tribute to the hundreds of cases in which enslaved black people filed for their freedom from bondage in federal courts in St. Louis. The most famous case was that of Dred Scott, in which the court held that black people had no rights which the white man was bound to respect. Dred Scott is buried in St. Louis in my district, and his legacy serves as a reminder of the dangers in believing that the Supreme Court has always been a just body. It has not. Substantive due process itself was birthed in the aftermath of the Civil War. It was not legal doctrine that led to the Emancipation Proclamation. It was not the court. It was not the Constitution, which was written to guarantee the rights of land-holding white men. It was not moral righteousness that led to the Emancipation Proclamation um, or the emancipation of black people. It was violence. It was war. It was the resistance and the persistence of abolitionists that put an end to chattel slavery. And it was because of our freedom dreams that the collective dreams of black people, past and present, who demanded to live in a world free of bondage. It is not lost on me as a descendant of enslaved people and as the first black congresswoman from the state of Missouri, that my existence in this space alone is a testament to the freedoms denied the Supreme Court by the Supreme Court of the United States in its Dred Scott decision 165 years ago. Professor Murray, footnote 41 of the majority opinion in Dobbs makes a eugenics argument on the impact of abortion in black communities. Can you explain the significance of footnote 41 as it relates to contraception? Sure. Um, to coin a term used by Representative Owens, um, you might view this as a kind of condescending racism, the court attempting to link the history of the modern birth control movement and reproductive rights to the history of eugenics uh, for the purpose of essentially arguing that reproductive rights are rooted in a history of racial injustice. Um, I believe that this footnote um, doesn't really bear on the logic of the Dobbs opinion, but rather is there to seed an opening for eventually overruling the right to contraception on the ground that it is a racial injustice. Um, the idea being that Margaret Sanger, through her work with the eugenics movement, um, was essentially trafficking in racial injustice. And for that reason, the right to contraception should be overruled as a means of remedying that racial injustice. Um, it is the most craven form of racial condescension, um, in part because it is being parroted by those who do nothing to assist the Black community, whether in their judicial opinions or in their actions and other beings. Thank you. Um, another question for you, Professor Murray. The Reconstruction Amendments were drafted not only to eradicate slavery, but also to eradicate the vestiges of slavery and all forms of bondage. The drafters wanted to go farther than making black people citizens and wanted to guarantee a sense of liberty. Can you talk about how the drafters defined or understood liberty when drafting the 13th and 14th Amendment? Yeah, so if the 13th Amendment abolished slavery and the 15th Amendment gave black men the right to vote, the 14th Amendment was primarily concerned with eradicating all of the indicia of slavery, the very things that distinguish slavery from freedom, among them the absence of bodily autonomy and control over procreation. And this was very clear. Um, they knew about forced birth as a means of expanding the slave population in the period before the Civil War. So they were responding to this. They also wanted to correct the injustice of having no family integrity, of lacking control over your children, of being ineligible for civil marriage. So in that grant of liberty in the 14th Amendment proceeds all of these rights that had been denied to the enslaved and were now given to them, they weren't explicit because they were viewed to be captured yes. in that grant of liberty. Justice Alito says nothing about this. Um, it is a selective and itinerant commitment to originalism that his opinion evinces. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Murray. As has been noted, this is the first time the court has taken away a fundamental right. 
It is important to note that our most fundamental rights have never been safe and they never will be guaranteed so long as they depend on the ideological whim of nine unaccountable, unelected justices with lifetime appointments. It is why we need to limit the power of justices by expanding the court, instituting term limits, enacting a code of ethics, and it reinforces why Congress should strip the court of the right to take away fundamental rights. Thank you, and I yield back. The gentlelady's time has expired. This concludes today's hearing. We thank all the witnesses for participating. Without objection, all members will have five legislative days to submit additional written questions for the witness or additional materials for the record. Without objection, the hearing is adjourned.